Hello, hello. Hey, squad. Hi, roof tile. We are... We have such chill vibes tonight. Hi, Sammy. Uh, I have just gotten back from vacation. Um... Oh my goodness, Blue Bean, thank you for the sub. Isa, also thank you for the sub. Oh my goodness. Thank you, thank you. So tonight is a very chill night. I have just got back from um, holiday vacation and we are playing some Pester Quest. So I don't know how this is going to look when we actually get into the game when it comes to like the, um, uh, the actual little screen because I have it kind of set up a little bit weird but that's okay so we'll see we'll see how it goes <clears throat> but uh but yeah so I was gonna play friend sim and then I was like you know what I just want to hop in fest request um and I still haven't played hive swap act 2 but uh that's okay so I might miss a couple references but I don't mind <laughs> um so we're gonna wait a couple minutes for people to come in anybody who might be coming in and then we'll get started for you know sometimes switch takes a few moments for the alert to go out but happy new year's roof tile are you doing anything special for uh for new year's day i will not be i will be vibing hi gay jesus <clears throat> hope you guys are all having a very lovely holiday oh the power wash sim is so fun sammy i've kind of been me it's one of those games that you can like you just you can just turn on, not think about, listen to music, listen to a podcast, do something kind of mindless. Oh, hi, Merp. Hello, hello. Oh my goodness, I'm kind of excited. I'm excited to see my 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 guys. All right. Okay. Um, we'll wait another minute or two, and then we'll hop in. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. Um, as far as Homestuck stuff, I've been reading some fan fiction. I've been writing some fan fiction. That's been fun. Um, my chair is so squeaky today. Oh my goodness. Um, been writing some fan fiction, which has been kind of fun. Um, been reading a lot. Um, uh, but outside of that, I haven't done much. I still haven't finished the Homestuck epilogues, which I know that Pester Quest does involve. But I know enough about the epilogues and also about Homestuck 2 that I think I'll be fine. Um, so. Also, I really don't want to read the epilogues. <laughs> I've avoided the epilogues by reading, like, fucking six million words of fan fictions <laughs> rather than reading the epilogues yeah you get it merp you understand all right uh let's hop in oh my god oh my god oh my god there's so many to go through oh okay we got to start volume one. Oh my god Oh, I, I, I literally cannot wait. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> All right, it's, uh, it's Egbert time. Let's go. Let's hop right in. It's been a long time coming. Oh, wait, tell me if the music the music's kind of loud. Let me see if I can turn the music down a little bit. Okay. Tell me if the music is either too loud or too quiet um, as we're going through. It's been a long time coming. You click to the last page of the Homestuck epilogues. You read it again. And then you read it again. You scroll down to go to the next section and find nothing. The little blue arrow you crave is nowhere to be found. What the fuck? Are you serious? What kind of ending was that? Absolutely nothing got resolved. <laughs> Absolutely nothing got resolved. You stand up so fast, your chair falls over. Jesus Christ, are you steamed. Maybe eventually with further uh, thought, you'll be able to appreciate the thematic element and con contributions to the narrative convention. But as of right now, you just need to understand what happened to dead John. What about Rose and Kanaya and their marriage? What about Terezi and Friska? Okay, the screen, I don't know if that's getting cut off at the end intentionally. <laughs> God, you have yeah, uh, you have to have words with someone. Stomping out of the little computer room, you blink a few times trying to readjust to the dim parlor after start or after staring at the screen for so long. Doc Scratch, where is that creepy round motherfucker? You sure you sure got his number now. You know all about how he ruined the lives of eight human kids and twelve trolls, how he played everyone including you. The very least he owes you is a satisfying conclusion to this story. 
You march off confidently down the halls in the direction of a sudden ruckus. Turning the corner, you see two figures. One is definitely Doc Scratch. The other is a dark silhouette in fashionable hat and coat. While you watch, the latter begins to hit the former with a cane. Oh god damn it. You know what's happening. You know some lore. You need to get out of here before this place goes up in flames. Survive now. Yell about unsatisfactory narratives later. With that in mind, you leave the you leave behind this ridiculous alt altercation, trampling a pile of notes and photographs underfoot as you make a run for the fenestrated wall. See ya, suckers. You sail through f you sail through feet first, bracing for the smell of overturned earth and the sight of the twin Alternian moons. Man, it's going to be good to see your friends again, especially now that you're armed with all this canon knowledge. But what surrounds you is not Father's Father's corpse field. It's a whole lot of nothing. Are you lost between worlds or something? Wait, no. You see a glimmer in the distance. A bright white light. Swallowing down a surge of panic, you move toward it. The light coalesces into the form of a small symbolic house. Hey, you recognize this symbol. You wonder if you can just sort of... Oh, okay. Well, you did that. A barrage of images hits you, broken, chaotic flashes, too fractured to make any sense. You just stuck your hand into the most powerful item in the whole of this narrative, and your body is not taking it well. A bright, sizzling pain hits the nerve center of your brain and radiates out of your extremities. Wow, you are a moron. You aren't a comic character. You aren't meant for this sort of metatextual energy. It hurts, it burns, it unravels you from the inside out, and then everything goes... white. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> uh, hi, Elipti. Hello, Stagcher. It's like fans watching Dream of SMP. <laughs> exactly. Oh my god. So right. What a lovely morning. The air is fresh and crisp. It's early spring, probably. You find yourself on the sidewalk in a suburban neighborhood, uh, facing a neat, friendly house. A neat, friendly boy stands at the window on the second floor, looking down at you. At least you hope he's friendly. Oh, hi, Denny. Thank you for the sub. Oh my god, it is a Homestuck uh, stream. And it's canon Homestuck this time. Or kind of canon. When is it not a Homestuck Chris stream? <laughs> That's true. It's been a few months since you've had a non Homestuck Chris stream. Man, you would really love to be his friend. At first, you think the boy is looking at you, but instead, he appears to be looking at the mailbox, which is stuffed so full that the door is half open. Looks like someone crammed a whole box in there. Helpfully, you pull it out, along with a couple coupons and envelopes stamped with a green symbol. You go to give the boy a thumbs up, but he is no longer at the window. Memory prickles the corners of your awareness. You feel like you've maybe done this before? While you're standing there ruminating, a car pulls up. A dr er, the driver is wearing a hat and suit, and is probably the owner of this house and the father of this friendly boy. Oh shit, you're just standing out here with all this mail. He's gonna think you're gonna try to rob the place. Play it cool, hide the evidence. We play it cool. Not wanting to behave like a complete buffoon and draw attention to yourself, you just hide all the mail back behind- er, all the mail- stuff behind your back. There's a bunch of envelopes though, and the box is bulky, so all of it just sort of slithers from your grasp like a bunch of dead snakes. The distinguished man in his flawless suit looks at you from across the yard. You can't see his eyes under the brim of his hat, but you are absolutely sure he is giving you a look of intense fatherly disapproval. No! A bolt of shame goes through you. Wow, this guy is good. He's not even your dad and you're just losing it under his, under his disapproval. You expect him to start shouting or calling the cops. You are so obviously stealing his mail, but instead he just keeps looking at you. Does he know you? Is he someone you should remember? Or is it just the platonic ideal of dadliness that crosses time and space, eternal in all iterations of reality? That sounds like some bullshit though. Slowly, the distinguished man shakes his head. He goes inside. You can't quite put a finger on it or on why, but you know you have been summarily dismissed. Oh. <laughs> and that's Pester Quest, everybody. Yeah, that's it. There's the stream. We did it. <laughs> Roll credits. Uh, skip to the first. There we go. Okay. Uh, hi, hide the evidence. Quick as you can, you turn around and dump everything in the sewer. Whatever. It was probably all garbage anyway who even uses their mailbox these days. The friendly and fatherly figure parks his car, climbs out and tips his hat to you. Then he walks uh, into the house, not sensing a single thing amiss. The perfect crime. Oh, but here comes the boy out the front door. God, you hope he wasn't coming down for the mail. A residential boy approaches. <laughs> I love John Egbert. 
Wait a minute, this is not the same boy you saw peeking through the window. It possibly is not a boy at all. It appears to be a mysterious gentleman. You wonder what business this fine upstanding neighborhood gentleman would have with you. Hey, I saw you standing out here messing with the mailbox. I figured you might be the mailman, even though you're not wearing a mailman outfit. Oh, oh yeah, that's you. You're definitely the mailman. Your outfit is, um, it's in the laundry today. You're just wearing your mailman hoodie instead. See the symbol? It's a symbol of, um, mail. Nothing stops the mail. Heh, <laughs> that's great. I guess it is true after all that mailmen are completely relentless in their quest to deliver people's mail. You guys are incredible. Speaking of mail, do you know if I got any today? What? No. What red package? You haven't seen anything like that. No bills, junk mail, nothing at all. The mailbox was empty when you looked inside. Um, well, I didn't say anything about a red package. Should I be expecting one? Come to think of it, it is my birthday, so getting a package in the mail would make sense. <laughs> So, did did our lovely reader here just derail the entirety of Homestuck? <laughs> Is that what happens? Did did our did reader jump into the Homestuck symbol and then completely? Because isn't um well sp obviously the Spur logo, but but John's birthday gift is um because the red one's from Dave, right? That has the bunny. The uh, oh my god, what's the bunny? What was the bunny from? Oh my god, what's the dumb movie? What's the dumb movie that the bunny reference is, is from? Oh, fuck, I can't remember. What's the stupid bunny? Um... Yeah, 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 live, live, live. Con Air, Con Air, that's what it is. Yes, Tiz, Tiz, oh. Oh my goodness. Hi, Tiz. It's from Con Air, my favorite movie. The Con Air Bunny. It's the Con Air Bunny. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <clears throat> oh my god, Tiz, are you excited to record tomorrow? I'm excited to record tomorrow. Um, well, I didn't say anything about a red packet. Oh, I already read that. And if it's red, that probably means it's from Dave. He loves red, because I guess it's cool. Oh man, I wonder what he got me. I haven't seen Pester Quest in so long. I am so excited to record tomorrow. <gasps> Yay! I'm excited too. It's gonna be fun. I haven't done any recording as Impulse yet, so it'll be my- or any official recording, because we did some- um, rehearsals like a hot minute ago, but it's been a while. I have to like watch some of his videos to get back in the voice of it. <laughs> nothing. He got you nothing, you say. <laughs> Isn't he listening? This day fellow probably forgot his birthday due to being a bad friend, and that's why there's no package, red or, red or, other, red or otherwise. Uh, what? <laughs> Oh, uh, just kidding, you say. Be sure Dave is a great friend who cares about this kid a lot. His present is probably just late and definitely not slowly sinking in a subterranean river of shit right now. <laughs> it's not... What? That's a strange thing to say. Are you sure you don't know more about Dave's present than you're telling me? No, you say. Absolutely not. Actually, he should forget what you said about the present being late. He should not be expecting a red package, not now or ever. He should trust you because all mailmen know everything about the mail. Dang. So, nothing else? Huh? You said the box was empty. I don't think I understand. Isn't that how it always is when you deliver mail? I mean, you're the guy who's supposed to put stuff in there. Yes, that's right. You're the mailman. The absolute authority over all mail. Which means your word must be accepted without question when it comes to the mail he didn't get today. You double-checked everything. You looked thoroughly through your bat, your mail bag for anything with this kid's name on it, and it came up empty. Sorry, dude. You have a mail bag. Where is it? Oh, uh, that old thing? You accidentally dropped it in the sewer before the boy came outside. Oh, no. That sucks. All that mail ruined. Maybe I can help you fish it out. No, you mean that's fine. Thank you for offering, fine young Samaritan. But um, the government will handle this. There's like insurance and stuff for sewer related postal mishaps. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. But what if you miss something in there for me? Like a game envelope or such? Are you totally sure you didn't miss something? Yes, you are sure. You triple checked and didn't see his name on anything. Besides, it's really ranked down there. Very sewery. All the mail has been befouled beyond any hope of salvaging it. Really, it is best not to bother even peeking inside. Uh, you're probably right, but hey, how do you know there wasn't any mail for me if you don't know my name? What? Oh, god damn it. Huh? Oh, you mean, of course you know his name. Mailmen are sort of like Santa Claus. They know the names of all good little boys of their, on their delivery routes. 
Wait, okay, that sounded creepy. You really regret phrasing it like that. It was so completely unnecessary. You just know a lot of stuff is an important government official with a lot of bureaucratic lists and such. For instance, the name of this young man is... Damn, why do you always have to paint yourself into corners like this? All you're trying to do is make a new friend and somehow you've managed to bullshit your way through the absolute most challenging version of this conversation possible. Okay, you can do this. This young man's name is... Wow, it really could be anything. He might as well have been given a random ass name this very day, shortly before you arrived for all you know. You'll just have to go with your gut, feel it out, a new friendship is on the line. His name is... Sisti... Wait, no. He's making a bad face, you're on the wrong track. J oh, he's working up, this is good. J nope, bad face again. It's not Jimmy, or um, Jilly Jillium? <laughs> That's not even a name, anyway. J yeah, he likes that jom... Jombery shit, he looks disgusted. Abort. John Bremmy, you really can be quite a fucking idiot sometime. Jo jo Jonderson? Wait, he looked pleased for a minute. And then it looked like he just sucked on 11. Jesus Christ, you were bad at this. You were there. John Der... John... John Der... Blit? Uh, yeah, nope, nope. I uh, got it. It's, it's there. It's... J oh, it's just John. Of course. You don't know what you were even thinking. Yes, you do. You... Those were just goofs. You explained it, John. Mailmen love goofs. His name is John, you say confidently, as if you had it in the bag all along. Not your non-existent mail bag, which you told him you dropped in the sewer, your real bag where the good shit is, such as your incredible ability to guess someone's name in five or six tries. Oh, that's right! <laughs> wow, I guess it's true that mailmen really do know practically everything. You smile. Finally. It feels like this friendship may be, may be starting to click. It was rocky there for a while, as you had to spin an intricate, f nearly flawless web of lies to smooth over the fact that you destroyed his cherished personal property. But you're pretty sure you're in the clear now. You've never had to justify yourself to him again. Well, as nice it is to meet you, Mr. Mailman, to be honest, this just kind of sucks. I've been waiting for a really cool game to arrive in the mail, but it's been a few days already, and, and now I'm starting to think it got lost in the mail? It might just never come now. I'm kind of bummed about it. I had hoped it would show up on my birthday as like a present from nobody really. Just a present out in thin air, I guess. Like it was going to be destiny or something. Oh well. I guess magic really is fake as all the scientists say it is. You nod along very wisely. Oh yes, you say. You can kiss that game goodbye. It is definitely lost in the mail and never going to be delivered. The postmaster general just told you a few seconds ago, um, through your wireless earpiece, which is hooked up to the U.S. Par to the U.S. parcel mail frame or mainframe. He tells John that he is right to disbelieve in magic. It's fake as shit. It's time for him to get used to the idea that he will never play this game, whatever it was. It was probably stupid anyway. Most games are. He should try to get used to whatever kind of life he is going to live from now on in the absence of this dumb video game. Yeah, you're right. I think I got too worked up about it. It probably does suck, actually. <laughs> it does. I, lo <laughs> I love this idea that, like, this random ass guy just... No, John. John, and you know what? Maybe it's better this way. I think it is better this way. You know, now we don't have the epilogues. Now Homestuck doesn't exist. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Homestuck doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Fucking congratulations. Let's go. We're winning. Thank God. Anyways. <clears throat> it doesn't exist anymore. We did it. I think Gamer only gave it like two hats out of five hats. Might have even been less than that, actually. God, what a piece of shit it probably was. You know, I think I, I think I have to thank you, Mr. Mailman. You really opened my eyes today. I'm just gonna forget I ever heard about that dumb game and just try to enjoy my life. Talk to my friends, hang out in my room, and I don't know. Come to think of it, maybe I was looking forward to playing that game with my friends so much because I'm lonely. I think I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. I don't actually have any real life friends. Oh, this is it. This is your in. This nice boy seems to be a chosening for a friendship just as much as you are, and you've laid out all the groundwork for becoming his best bro so expertly. You just need to slide in, or slide right into his life with a few more sympathetic remarks. You actually have a lot of experience with this by now. You've made so many friends in so many strange places with such mixed results, or you think you did? Actually, you can't conjure up any of their names or faces right now probably isn't that important. Anyways, or actually, let's never speak of that again. What matters most is you're here now making a sweet new pal named John. 
you casually mention that this is the end of your mail route and you don't have much else going on in your life. Maybe you and he can hang out for a while, if he doesn't mind that is. Hmm, you want to hang out with me? Like, just a mailman and a 13 year old boy just being buddies? You shrug a little, as if you don't care that much, but you really, really care. Normally I would say that sounds a little strange and maybe slightly inappropriate, but what do I know? If I were, or if you were a normal looking mailman, that would probably be a shitty idea and I'd get in trouble with my dad or the authorities or something, and probably so would you. But you seem different. Like, maybe you aren't even a person? You're just kind of a weird, harmless looking guy. Like an alien, but not really. You don't really know what to say to any of that. Oh man, I'm being so fucking rude, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course we can hang out. Maybe we should, uh... Keep this sort of thing a secret from my dad. I don't know if he would approve of me bringing a stranger into the house, even if you are very nice and sincerely concerned about my male problems. That sounds fine with you. Now that you think about it, you still aren't sure his dad didn't see you dump all their stuff into the sewer. He probably didn't, otherwise he would have had some words for you, surely. But still, it's a risk you shouldn't be taking under these delicate circumstances. There's a friendship on the line. Okay, I'm glad you agree. Sounds like we have a sneaking mission ahead of us. Actually, it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, it does sound fun. Maybe slightly, uh, maybe, except maybe slightly triggering since you've done a lot of dangerous high stakes sneaking in the past that you can't quite remember, but still fun, mostly fun. You, you can't wait, yeah. So, how should we do this? We could either sneak upstairs to my bedroom while avoiding my dad or just hang out up, up there or, and just hang out up there for a while. Or if that sounds too risky, we could just stay outside. I've got some sweet playground equipment in the backyard. What will it be? Um, let's go inside. Let's try to let's try to sneak inside. <gasps> when you enter the house, an overwhelming odor of freshly baked cakes cakes hits you like a punch in the face. Wow, there's also a lot of clown bullshit in the living room. Clown statues, and you don't have time to take it all in because your buddy John is grabbing your hand and rushing upstairs before his baking manic of a father can emerge from the kitchen and catch you in the act. He slams the bedroom door behind you and breathes in a sigh of relief. Hard to catch a moment of peace around here, but well, with all the adoring fatherly doting and round the clock cake production, I feel like I'm suffocating in here, and it's not just because of the thick aroma of Betty Crocker products that makes me feel like I'm being gassed in a bakery. You're not sure what to say, you tentatively lift your arm, as if you're about to place it on his shoulder, but you hesitate. Is this an abusive domestic situation? You don't know if you have enough information to make that judgment yet, but you are concerned. Ha, huh, just joking around. I mean, this baking shit is all a bit too much, the con obsession too, but I love my dad. He's great. Sorry, I didn't mean to give the wrong impression. And that's a relief, you guess. Not that you weren't ready to jump in and be whatever kind of supportive friend that this boy needs. Suddenly you notice a bunch of movie posters on the wall and oh wow, these are all really bad. <laughs> You won't dare say such a thing to your new friend, though. You immediately begin lavishing praise on all of them, especially that one which appears to be Mac and me? Oh, for fuck's sakes. When it rains, it pours, you guess. Nevertheless, you insist it is one of humanity's peak cinematic achievements. Mac and me? You seriously like it? Personally, I think it's a piece of shit. I just have it up there because, well, I don't know why. Not even I can defend the film. <laughs> Each his own, I guess. I'm happy to hear you like all the other movies, though. They're all incredible. You have good taste. Except for liking Mac and Me, though. It's complete garbage. Okay, you can admit you got a little overzealous there. Maybe dial it down a notch? You really don't have to try so hard. <laughs> there is a moment of awkward silence. You hadn't really thought this far ahead, and apparently neither has John. There must be something you can both do to advance this friendship. He's starting to look a little self-conscious now. Poor friendless kid really doesn't know how to entertain anyone in his home, does he? You can see now that your friendship is needed more than ever. You have to step up. So, um, what do you typically like to, uh... Suddenly, something gets John's attention. It's coming from his computer. Oh, hey, can you hang on a second? My, Dave, my buddy Dave is pestering me. John settles behind his desk. Dude, what are you doing? Dave, you'll never guess what I'm doing right now. Uh, are you opening the birthday present I got? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ooh. Ooh. Uh-oh. Oh no, sorry Dave. I think your got present got I think your present got lost in the mail. Unfortunately, I think it might be gone forever. John, what the fuck? Maybe you can just send me another one, whatever it was? Dude, no. The thing I got you was fucking priceless and irreplaceable. If it's lost in the mail, there's literally zero chance you will ever see another one ever like it again in any shape or form. Wow. That sucks. 
Oh well, whatever. To be honest, it, that's probably the fate uh, it deserves. What was it? Never mind, just some more ironic trash from your best and coolest bro in the world. Just forget it. If I tell you, you'd probably be sad it's gone. So this is a secret I will take to me, or I will take with me to my fucking grave. Do you understand that, Egbert? Yeah, that's fair. So what are you really up to? Are you playing that dumb game with Rose yet? What? Oh, no. That got lost in the mail, too. It's also gone forever. Holy fucking shit, John. I leave you alone for two seconds and everything goes to hell. This is why I can't stop pestering you for even a second. You just lose complete control of your life the moment I turn my back. How do you even know it got lost in the mail? Like, how can that be formally verified in any way? You haven't even been waiting uh, for it that long. Because the mailman told me. What? Okay, I know this is almost every day, but that is actually the dumbest thing I've ever fucking heard. It's true! He was quite sure about it. First of all, John, mailmen don't know shit. They're just guys who walk around handing out letters and stuff. They have zero knowledge of the greater workings of the mail, let alone the specific fate of any given package. Unless there's a tracking number or some shit, but even then the mailman isn't really the guy who deals with that. The only way a mailman would know for sure if some mail got lost is if he was the one who lost it, or like deliberately fucking destroyed it. Between the game and my sweet present going missing, something smells goddamn fishy here. John, are you sure the mailman didn't steal all your shit? Of course I am. I don't know, man. He wasn't even holding anything when I talked to him. In not even a mailbag. My alarm bells are going fucking haywire here. It sounds like this incompetent dipshit just lost all your mail and tried to cover his ass. No? Are you sure he didn't fuck it up somehow? Like, a ma like get mailman stank on it and in a fit of shame and panic, like, buried it or dunked it in a smelly hole? Dave, this is insane. You're being so paranoid. Besides, aside from the birthday present, why do you even care? You think the game is stupid and you don't even want to play it. Well, yeah, well, I was lying my ass off to sound cool and aloof. Of course I want to play this game. It's like, it's like this whole rad thing we were all going to do as friends and now it's ruined. Aww. You're right. That is a shame. I'm sorry. I don't know. I just f had some feeling that we had to play or that we needed to play this thing for like destiny reasons or some shit. Sorry to blow my cool cover and start sounding like Jade or whatever, but I'm kind of pissed off now, especially, or I'm kind of pissed off now, especially now that I know you won't get your sick bunny. Bunny? Forget I said anything. Well, okay. Anyway, all that aggravating bullshit aside, what were you gonna say? All right, I made a new friend. What? A friend? Or, um, a friend? Bullshit. No, it's true. John, this is so unlike you. You don't have any fucking friends. None of us do. We're a bunch of total losers. I know that, but today is a different story. I think I might be branching out a little socially. Like, turning a corner and becoming a valid, legitimate person well on his way to adulthood. Ugh. Come on, Dave. Why can't you just be happy for me? Fine. So you're hanging out with this person right now? Yes, he's in my room, um, rummaging through my stuff. <laughs> he's quite the character. Who is this guy? Please tell me he's not cooler than me. I couldn't handle that. He's not cooler than you. Nobody is, Dave. Okay, thank God. So, tell me about him. Um, well, you know the mailman I was talking about earlier? Yeah. Well, you see, <laughs> it's the mailman. Jesus fucking Christ. What? John. No. What's the big deal? Do I even need to explain why a 13 year old kid shouldn't become buddies with a fucking mailman and hang out with him in his room? Does your dad know about this? Well, no, but I'm trying to avoid him. He's in one of his baking frenzies. You do realize this is the same guy who likely stole your game and my beautiful present, right? He probably sold them in the black market or worse. He did something fucked up with them like flushed them down a toilet. He didn't do that, Dave. It would make no sense to do that. You're being crazy. Okay, dude, but you're the one chilling with a random postal worker in your bedroom on your B-Day. I'm just looking out for you. What sort of sick fuck would even want to come into your house? How old is the fucking guy anyway? I don't know, he seems to be sort of... ageless? What? <laughs> Dave, that's the thing. He's barely even a person. He's just a friend. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Listen, I don't expect you to understand. He's just a fun, harmless person who appears to have no particular defining qualities whatsoever. What's so crazy about that? Nothing, I guess. I don't even know anymore. Fine. Enjoy your new buddy. It is your B-Day after all, so you get to call the shots. So what's next on the agenda? What's he even doing now? Well, it seems like he got a little bored while I've been talking to you and has spent most of, uh, or has spread most of my belongings across my bed and floor to examine everything, and now he's just messing with my stuff? Like, magic stuff. <laughs> it's pretty cute. I like this guy. John, I'm gonna run something by you. I hope you, or I hope I don't blow your mind or anything, but what if this guy isn't even a mailman? What? Dave, no. I refuse to accept that. 
Okay then, genius, tell me this. What is he wearing? Um, you said he has no defining qualities. Well, clothes are defining qualities. So what are they? Okay, he isn't wearing anything but a sweatshirt. But I didn't want to mention that because I knew how that would sound. I see. So, no mail uniform, no mailbag, no, like, fucking mailman hat, just no pants. Yes, but that's not weird or anything. I told you, he's like a, a pet. Shit, that probably sounds condescending. You know, you know what I mean? Part generic person-y type guy, part, like, just a fun, friendly sort of humanoid cr creature? I'm really not explaining this well. The point is, he said he's a mailman, and I believe him because he's my new friend. End of story. Okay, okay, he's the fucking mailman. I don't even care if you think he's fine, then okay, whatever. So like, cool? Guess we have a new friend. Do I get to meet the mailman sometime, or, or what? Hmm, that's a good question. I hope so. I wouldn't be surprised if he found his way over to you. I can't quite put a finger on it, but something tells me he's a well-traveled fellow. You really think he's gonna well-travel his ass 2,000 miles away? <laughs> you think he's gonna... <laughs> you think he's going to well... <laughs> Deadpan, deadpan, deadpan. <laughs> you really think he's going to well travel his ass 2,000 miles over here to come visit me? You never know. Mailman do get around after all. Shit, that checks out actually. Okay, I'm getting kind of excited now. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. I should probably get going. He's really going at it over there with all my bedroom crap. I don't want it to be a rude host. All right, I'm going to leave you boys to it. Happy birthday, dude. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Yes! Oh, look at the <laughs> Oh my god, that was an amazing- that was amazing. Oh my god. Okay, I have to do- <clears throat> I- he has- he has one more route, right? <laughs> we have one more route on this one. Um, we hide the evidence. And then we stay outside. Actually, you tell John you think that fresh air out here will do you some good. Also, that playground equipment he mentioned really sweetens the pot. You hope he doesn't mind. Aw, tis! Thank you for the gift sub. To a butterfly a girl KMC. Thank you, thank you. After all, as a mailman, you were meant to be outdoors. You took the mailman's oath and everything. Uh, yeah, John will probably believe that. Sure, no problem. I totally understand. It gets really stuffy in there, especially with all the baking my dad does. We can hang out in my yard. Feels like it's been ages since I took a spin on the old pogo ride. Pogo ride, he says? Well, that just seals the deal. You boy, or you, you bow, you bow flamboyantly and gesture for him to lead the way, but you quickly regret doing that because it was a little much. Well, here it is, my backyard in all its glory. I hardly come out here anymore, honestly. There's an old trusty swing set. Ah, brings back some good memories. And there's the pogo ride. You better hop on before I beat you to it. <laughs> John really likes his pogo ride. <laughs> Just kidding. That thing is a death trap. You should really go nowhere near that thing, unless you like dying. Oblivious to the humorous nature of his remark, you shake your head solemnly. Oh no, you say. You're pretty sure dying sucks and you never want to do it again. Huh, that's a weird thing to say. Are you saying you've died before? Or is this some sort of weird mailman joke? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you mailmen like to joke around a lot, sometimes very darkly. It gets very stressful delivering the mail sometimes, and sometimes you just need to blow off some steam by making light of your morality, and... It doesn't seem like this is going over well. To be fair, it is one of your worst explanations so far, and that's really saying something. You start to falter and lose composure. You don't seem to like, or you don't seem to have it in you to follow through with the lie. You stop talking and hang your head. Hey, what's wrong? You decide to tell him the truth. Yes, you've been dead before. Possibly a bunch of times? You're not sure. Actually, you can't remember any of the circumstances surrounding your deaths. And you aren't even sure who you are, frankly. You're a little confused by your own existence sometimes. Oh no. <laughs> well, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a little hard to believe. But I'll listen to what you have to say, because that's what friends are for. How did that happen? Oh, well... You cast your mind back as hard as you can. You really give it a good hard think. You remember a room, a computer screen, and just this really intense feeling of frustration. A computer screen? I don't... I mean, I get being very frustrated at your computer screen. I do that every day. Yeah, he gets it. It's written all over his face. This is a boy who feels your pain. He's following you perfectly. I'm not really following. Then you explain how you ended up in the afterlife. Afterlife? 
You're pretty sure it was the afterlife. Maybe heaven? It was a little too freaky for heaven, but you were alone, and then you found this mysterious artifact on the ground. You found a mysterious artifact in hell? Yes, it was white and flat and lying on the ground as if it was just waiting for you, or waiting for someone else maybe, but you found it first by accident. You find it hard to believe you were destined for such a cursed treasure such as himself, such as this. Perhaps the artifact belonged to Lucifer himself. Lucifer? Wow. Oh, you didn't realize you said Lucifer thing out loud. Maybe you should consider reeling this in a bit. You're beginning to wonder if you're coming off as a little unhinged here. Except, Sean is clearly transfixed by your story and looking a little concerned. You guess there's no going back now. You've committed yourself to the truth, as insane as it sounds. So you saw something weird. It looked a little like a house. The obvious thing to do was stick your hand inside the house, so that's what you did. Then you felt funny and teleported out of hell. That's how you ended up here, on Earth, where um, you then became a mailman and decided to have a long and rewarding career delivering the mail, and then you met John and you basically were friends now, Ed. That sounds pretty fucked up. Yes, it does, doesn't it? You're probably back to feeling like a crazy person again. He probably, or you're right, you're right back to feeling like a crazy person again. He probably doesn't believe you. It seems like you're going to have to take this even further or risk eroding the foundation of trust this blossoming friendship is built on. You mentioned that you're pretty sure the devil's treasure gave you some magic powers. Magic powers? Like what? You're not sure. You can, you can sort of teleport now. Also, you're pretty sure you can time travel. You haven't tested out much, you admit. Teleportation and time travel, huh? That's a lot. Suspicious. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Reader has has John's retcon powers, <laughs> and just and just got them. So, okay, if we're taking this in Homestuck fashion, um, Reader isn't just making a new time. Like this isn't an alternate timeline, right? Because that's not how the retcon powers work. The retcon powers literally change the current timeline. So. By technicality, um, this is now the new Homestuck canon, and Reader is fucking everything up. Um, Homestuck is no more. Crab Brave. <laughs> you can prove it, you say desperately. Suddenly it feels like this friendship is hanging by a thread, and you'll do anything to preserve it. It's time to bring out the big guns, the revelation to this boy that, contrary to all known scientific wisdom, magic is far from fake. It is real as shit. For instance, you remind him that you both went up to his bedroom, but decided not to because the trek across the house was too risky, but what if you could just teleport there? Sounds like a handy trick, but I'm guessing this is all still bullshit though, like a prank. That's okay, I love pranks. Ah, but it's no prank. At least you think. You've never actually tested the power at all. God, you hope you don't end up making a fool of yourself. Everything is riding on this. What are you? Here goes nothing. <gasps> oh my god, he has the retcon powers! Whoa, it worked! Unbelievable. Do you know what this means, Mr. Mailman? You shake your head. It means magic is fucking real! You shrug. You guess it is. You won't admit it. But all you care about right now is the fact that you saved the friendship. It should be all smooth sailing from here. Well, you did a pretty good thing, or it's a pretty good thing I met you, because if you didn't show up, I'm pretty sure that nothing anywhere close to this incredible would ever happen to me. <laughs> Well, well, but John, what if you got the teleporting retcon time travel windy powers? But what if you did? Think about it. I mean, then you would be depressed. Then you'd be like really depressed. <laughs> I mean, then you would end up like in your, you know, 30s and 40s, like really depressed and have like a broken marriage. And also you die by like a, a tooth in your stomach. And also, like, you <laughs> you fuck a troll in a car? It's pretty fucked up. It's kind of crazy. Um, don't think about it. <clears throat> Murph, don't you remember that part of the summary of the epilogues? That, that John and Friska fuck <laughs> in a car? <laughs> yeah. Am I, am, I, am I misremembering? We need Mel in here. I want to protect this job. Not just any car. Wait, it's the dad's car, isn't it? <laughs> and is it while he has the tooth in him? Isn't he like mid dying while he's fucking Briska in the dad's car? Am I crazy? Is that what it was? Because it's Caliborn's tooth, right? Or was it Caliborn's tooth? Yeah, yeah, the gold tooth. <laughs> and he's like, oh, it's Terezi. I thought it was Briska. Right, because Vriska's still missing. 
Ellipti, listen. This is all epilogue stuff. You don't. This is not important. <laughs> this is not important. I'm not. This is not spoilers because nobody gives a shit about the epilogues. The epilogues are fucking absurd. Um, and then he dies after, not during. But other than that, yes, it would be funny if he died during. <laughs> it would be really funny if he died during. <laughs> Well, it's a pretty good thing I met you. <laughs> Jersey smells his blood while she hears him die or whatever the line is. That's wild. That is so wild. Yeah, yeah, Elifty, it's... Yeah, the epilogues are something. And you know what? Elifty, you know what's funny? Not even the worst part of the epilogues. Not even close to the worst part of the epilogues. That's the crazy part. Well, it's a pretty good thing I met you, because if you didn't show up, I'm pretty sure that nothing anywhere close to this, to, to being this incredible would ever happen to me. You consider that remark for a moment and decide that you absolutely agree. You are definitely the best and most exciting thing that will ever happen to this kid. That was actually a fairly tame section comparatively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you also said something about time travel? Can we try that too, or would that be too disruptive to the space-time continuum? You have him eating out of the palm of your hand now. No need to slow this train down. Continue him shim 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 Whatever your new friend wants, he gets. Oh, I know. Why don't we just go back in time about a week? Every time I hear something about the epilogues, it gets worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we can stay right here. That way we won't risk messing anything up important. It is nothing compared to Jane's polyamorous marriage when she has a baby with her husband named by her boyfriend who is named after said boyfriend's crush. <laughs> oh, and then also Jay and, and oh, and then also Jane is 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 troll Hitler. Can we talk about that too? Can we talk about how Jane is a fascist? Can we talk about how Jane is a literal fascist that wants to commit troll 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 genocide? That too. <laughs> also that she has the, isn't the baby the baby is um the baby is you <laughs> then constant references are made to that boyfriend entering a child's room at night and john is treated like he's fucking insane for thinking that's kind of concerning oh yeah that too yeah it's so bad <laughs> it's so yikes anyways Anyways, if I have to think about the epilogues for one more second, I will go batshit. Um, sure, that makes sense. You get ready to use your new hell power and concentrate as hard as you can on the idea of one week ago. That's probably how it works. Hmm. Not much changed, except... Wait. The cakes are gone. That means it isn't my birthday yet, which means it worked. This is one week ago. Wow. Uh, um... <laughs> oh, no. Um, oh, for fuck's sake. I forgot, of course, there was going to be a past me in the room a week ago. Oh, God, I'm such an idiot. This is going to fuck things up, isn't it? What the hell is going on here? Whatever it is, it seems really stupid. You're right, John. It is stupid. I'm sorry. I wasn't using my head. Don't worry. We'll get out of your hair. Hey, quick, let's zap out to the yard so we fuck up space time a little less as possible, or as little as possible. Whew. Well, that was dumb. Maybe let's try to avoid abusing your time travel powers from now on. It could really lead to a lot of messy bullshit. You wholeheartedly agree. All you want to do is make friends, not clown around through space time. Meanwhile, I guess we just... We're, I guess we're still a week in the past, but now just standing in my yard doing nothing? This seems pointless. We should probably head back to the present. You nod. It was an interesting experiment, and it brought you a lot of credibility, but it's time to... Wait a minute. Something is wrong. There's a slight buzzing in the air. You can feel it. What's the matter? You tell him you think, you think someone is coming, quick, you have to hide! Oh, okay. You and John dash into a neighbor's yard and hide behind the fence. You peek into the backyard to see what's happening. Suddenly you see it, the energy you were feeling. Was a whole group of teenagers randomly teleporting into John's backyard? What the fuck? You examine more closely, they're all dressed in ridiculously colorful outfits. Is the circus in town? The, there did seem to be a lot of clowns in John's house. Maybe this house is some kind of globally recognized headquarters for traveling clowns. But they're not really clowns, just teens wearing strange pajama-looking clothes. Eight of them to be... <laughs> Are you... What is going on? Is this all four of them? Are all... What? 
On closer inspection, one of them seems familiar. The guy in the blue pajamas. You think it's your friend John? But he seems older. Definitely not a 13-year-old kid like your buddy here. None of them are. They all appear to settle in for a while and talk amongst themselves. The guy in the yellow speedo gets down to business on the pogo ride, totally oblivious to its dangers. There seems to be a serious atmosphere hanging over this group of teens. Important discussions are happening. It's completely baffling to you, and by the look on your buddy's face, to John as well. Suddenly, there's an uneasy feeling that settles over you, like you're witnessing something that was never meant to be seen by anyone. Perhaps a rendezvous point established by this group of teens for exactly that reason, that no one would think to be watching this quiet suburban backyard right now. Should you stay and listen, or go? You're not sure what to do. You can't shake the feeling that something highly inappropriate is happening here just by watching, like you're being, be like you're beholding a moment so divorced from authoritative, from an authoritative chain of events that to even witness this moment is not only narratively compromising but extremely cursed. Hey, is that guy in the blue pajamas me? You pat John on the back. You can only imagine what's going through his head right now. He hasn't seen a time travel duplicate of himself in well minutes. Man, I look so much older. What am I even wearing? How are all these people? Wait, I know some of them. That's Rose and Dave and Jade with dog ears. <laughs> I don't know the other ones though. Wait, I know what's going on. They must be from the future. It is the only explanation, especially since we just did some time travel ourselves, this proving magic to be real. Did you have something to do with this, Mr. Mailman? You shake your head. You're just as surprised by this nonsense as he is. It seems one or more people from this group have somehow obtained similar abilities offered by the hell treasure you touched. I guess they are from a few years in the future, where we have become a bunch of older, cooler teenagers. Maybe we all go to college together or something? Hmm. Maybe that's where we make these four new friends. There's something familiar about all of them, but I can't put my finger on it. But why do we look so ridiculous? Did I join a troop of traveling street performers, thus following in the footsteps of my father? And somehow manage to rope everyone into the act, including Dave and Rose, who almost certainly would think it, the idea was really stupid even though it's clearly great and cool, while somehow also involving time travel? I don't know. I'm so confused. What are they all even doing here? Did this really happen just outside my house one week ago without me knowing about it at all? What else have I been missing? How much more is there uh, to know about the future adventures of me and my friends, which has been taking place in secret like this? I wonder if there's a lot more in my life than I ever could have imagined. Actually, I should probably be thanking you. If you hadn't told me my game got lost in the mail, I might have gotten way too hung up on it. That might have totally altered the trajectory of my life. Then I wouldn't get to go on whatever sweet adventures happen in the future that will lead me to wear a bunch of these silly pajamas and apparently speak with the great authority in front of a group of very cool teens. You bow your head, Quantum. Well, but, but I think, but, okay, but now we have Paradox because that, how does that, because that has to still happen, but also the rec John's retcon powers are really fucking weird, and that's what Reader touched. This is when John has to retcon back to kill Lord English. Oh, I don't think I read that far in the epilogue. I will say, I, I didn't read all the epilogues. Is this from the meat? Um, is this from the meat? timeline because I remember because in meat he does go back to Colored English because I read about half of candy and then I kind of stopped because I was bored <laughs> I need to finish reading meat but um oh interesting that is really interesting after some time time passes the group of teens seems to finish up whatever business they had in this yard and then disappear into thin air you guess that's the end of whatever that was since there isn't much point to staying here a week in the past you decide to return John to the present moment Huh. Well, that was interesting. We were a little too far away to hear what they were saying. I wonder- or I think I kept overhearing the word English? I wonder if some of those teens speak a foreign language. Was I teaching them English? Oh, it sure is shitty speculation. It makes no sense at all. I guess the only thing to do is wait until I become that John and then find out for myself. Sounds exciting, but also a little overwhelming. Damn, I'm gonna need to think about this. This is what precedes the core situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. He watches John spaces out for a solid minute, thinking about his absurd future. You glance toward that swing set, wondering if the few fun times John had planned for you are going to continue to recede further into the distance as he comes to gripes with his mysterious destiny. You cough a little to snap him out of his stupor. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mailman. I know I said we would do something fun, but now I'm kind of in an existential mood. I should have, or I should ha take a walk and think about what just happened today. I feel weird. It's nothing personal. Just need some space. Well, see ya. Vague existential crisis. 
Oh, look at little John. Oh, the little guy. What a little feller. Oh my god, I love these little these little sprites or these little um uh, end pages for the 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 little routes so much. All right, it's Rose time. Oh my god, Rose. It's Rose time. <clears throat> On the advice of your new friend John, you go visit one of his close comrades. Close only figuratively speaking, since it seems she lives all the way on the other side of the country. That's no problem for you, though, since your new powers let you hop anywhere, anytime, even to places that don't exist. I'm asleep. Uh, I'm a sleepy times now. Good luck with Rose. Thank you, Tizzy. I will talk to you tomorrow. Well, you think your powers let you do that. Or, you think your powers let you do that. You just have this distinct metatextual feeling that you could pretty much go anywhere at this point. You know that doesn't make much sense. There's nothing that doesn't make sense about friendship, or there's nothing that doesn't make sense about friendship, though. And that's exactly what you're about to do. Friendship, that is. You're about to make some friendship. You're about to do some friendship by making a new friend. Her name is, you check your notes, Rose. This is her house, apparently. It looks like some kind of, or it looks kind of weird and modern, and it's situated in the middle of the woods for no good reason you can think of. It's also pouring rain, which is not what you would describe as an ideal friend-making condition. Still, nothing stops a mailman, not from delivering mail nor making friends. Rather famously, rain and other similar weather patterns provide no deterrent to the performance of his duty. And there is no duty more important than friendship. <gasps> Rose! Looks so pretty! Oh my goodness. Oh, thank you, Gay Jesus, for the hydrate. Oh my god, she's so pretty. Oh my god, I love her. I love Rose so much. I love all of them. I love Rose. <clears throat> Your hand? Your hand? <clears throat> Suddenly, a woodland girl approaches. Who goes there? Oh, it's your new friend Rose, obviously. There's literally no one else this could be. You introduce yourself. You are the cool mailman who John told her to expect a visit from soon. You would doff your mail hat to, sign to signal a friendly greeting, except recently you accidentally dropped it into a sewer, along with all your other mail-specific clothes, as well as all the mail you were supposed to deliver, as you explained to her gratuitously in an unconvincing manner. It's not a great start, you admit, but you've done much worse. You are not a mailman. Yikes. You are busted almost immediately. You briefly consider whether you should double down on the lie or try to say something mailman-like or whether the right call is to come clean, since she's clearly too smart for this amateur bullshit. But it's taking a few seconds too long for you to decide, which also looks guilty as hell. That's it, the jig is up, you slouch in defeat. You ask her if she would please consider not telling John. Your heart couldn't take it if he found out your entire friendship was based on a lie. You want me to keep a secret from one of my best friends to protect the feelings of a random buffoon who I've never met and arbitrarily showed up to my house in the remote wilderness like a creep. Yes. Um, yes, that's what you want. It is an interesting proposition, if for no other reason than its audacity. I admire your resolve in the face of humiliation. This doesn't mean we're friends, though. Whoa, rough. Well, that's fine, you're hopeful. Your mind is fuzzy, but you think you remember this. You're good at this. You're excellent at making people like you through underhanded means. You can't wait to take advantage of this 13-year-old girl's goodwill. Okay, wow, not like that. Let's not be fucking weird. In fact, let that be the last creepy thought you have for comical purposes. S grade jokes only. Let's all get our brains out of the gutter. Rose raises a thin brow. There's something pretty unsettling about her deep violet eyes. You're pretty sure most humans don't have eyes like that, but what the fuck do you know? You're a stranger around these parts. Wait, aren't you human too? Whatever, it's not a big deal. Not when there are friends to be made, or something. Do you want to come inside, unless I'm interpreting your internal mon- or unless I'm interrupting your internal monologue, of course. Far be it for me to ever cut short any sort of navel-gazing sidebar. It's just ever so slightly wet out here. You would absolutely love that, if it's not too much. Trouble, of course. You wouldn't want to put Rose out. You're lying, though. You are 100% fine with being absolutely infuriatingly obnoxious if it means making a friend. Rose purses her lips, considering. Your predilections towards mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh? He also said that you had certain powers. 
powers of teleportation and time travel. I told him that he must be mistaken since it's well known and an accepted fact that magic, although a popular and highly engaging subject of fiction, is fake as hell. Oh, your zappy powers? No, those are totally real and not fake. Real in a, in a different way than you being a mailman is real since that is actually made up. Is that so? Prove it. You shrug, easy enough. You hold out a hand, and after a moment of hesitation, Rose puts her fingers in yours. Her nails are long and sharp and painted glossy black. Okay, she's a lesbian. One of those fingers is not long, we all know this. She closes her eyes and her umbrella droops. Should I picture my room or something similar? I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work. You still think that, uh, or she still thinks you're fucking with her. You tell her that you guess she can do that if she wants. You zap the two of you inside, the big modern house, and when you open your eyes, you find yourself in a large, messy bedroom. Oh. She drops her umbrella. You... you really did that. Rose stands in the center of her room in, the full, in her full rain gear, her boots tracking muddy prints into the thick white carpet. Surprise! You really are magic. Rose puts a small hand against her perfectly painted black lips. She seems momentarily lost for words, and you get the feeling that this is not a thing that happens very often. Her eyes are wide and deeply purple. They're sparkling, you might even say. Hold on, I'll be right back. Stay here. Don't go out into the hall. It's not... it's not safe. You tell Rose to take her time. You're happy to just stand here, dripping on her nice clean floor. She leaves the room, and you take the opportunity to examine your surroundings a little more closely. The bed is unmade, the books are strewn over the floor carelessly, and a collection of half-drunk cups of coffee crowd the desk. Half-finished knitting projects lie in soft piles over the room. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that this room is often occupied by someone with a lot of interest who has trouble settling down and putting her attention to one thing at a time. Man, you relate. Not with interest, but with friends. You can't imagine settling just for one. Rose has a number of posters on her wall, although nowhere near as many as your friend John. A calendar hangs beside her window. Days ticked off with little X's, all the way up to 413, which is circled. You step closer to read the year date up in the corner. 2009. But what the hell do you care about the date? You can make friends any day of the damn week, rain or shine, night or day. Rose sure is taking a while out there. She told you that it wasn't safe out in the hall. Maybe she hadn't been... Maybe she hadn't been quipping. Maybe she's actually in trouble. What should you do? Go look for a safe bet. Are we gonna see Ma? Are we gonna see uh, Mama Roxanne if we go look? I'm gonna go look. You're too anxious to sit still, and you aren't the sort of person who just sits there and waits for friends' oppor for friend opportunities to fall into their lap. Better run headlong into danger, or as much danger as a minimalist upper middle class house in the middle of the woods can offer. Rosa told you that it isn't safe. You creep into the hallway, where a bunch of things happen more or less simultaneously. A deluge of quick time events that you had no idea were coming. Lightning flashes in a perfect jagged line across the tall window at the end of the hall, followed immediately by the crash of thunder so loud you think the house might be falling down. Abruptly, all the lights go out. <gasps> Another flash of lightning for a vert, vert, what is this word? Vertiginous? Vertiginous? moment you see a long thin figure superimposed against the window you freak the fuck out jumping about a foot in the air and yowling like a cat a small hand lands on your shoulder and you jump again calm down it's just me rose speaks in a normal tone of voice and it's jarring the house is echoey and cavernous and there's something about a dark room on a stormy evening that makes you want to whisper adjective or er, adject adject ugh. adjective causing vertigo especially by being extremely high or steep, I see. I told you to stay put for a reason. It's too early for my mother to be sauced enough to not notice random strangers in her house, and I don't want to go through the tedious process of explaining who you are. You have a perfectly understandable reason for why you left, and the reason is that you were lonely. Rose snorts. Cold. You mean you were cold. Well, you are soaking wet. Follow me. She grabs you by the wrist and tows you down the hall. You wonder if you should warn her about the strange wraith-like creature you saw by the window, but you don't want to freak her out. Although, her mom might be at risk too, so... Whatever. Moms are tough. She'll be fine. This probably isn't the first time she's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a weird Slenderman. This house looks as haunted- or looks haunted as shit. Rose takes you to a dark laundry room, then motions you to take off your hoodie, which you do, gladly, because it is soaking wet. That's interesting. Hmm? The design on the front. Does it mean anything? Oh, yeah, it's kind of cool. A blue line that zigzags on one end like lightning. Looking at you makes it feel- looking at it makes you feel unsettled. You realize Rose is waiting for a response, so you just hand her the hoodie and tell her no. You're pretty sure it's just an abstract symbol. Is that, um, somebody's sign? Is that a troll sign from Hive Swap? 
um, that I'm guessing Rear got gifted it or something. It's blue, right? Blue, um, high spot bowls. I'm looking. Can I find? Oh, there's so many. There's so many. Oh, it's a Malik hoodie. Right, right. Okay, okay, okay. Malik. I just want to see him again. Oh, it is Malik. I do see that. We didn't get to Malik's root in um in uh what do you call it? In High Swap. Um, or in, in Frenson. But I'm guessing we are chill as fuck with Malik then. You realize Rose is still waiting for a response. Oh, go on. You then stand there while she tosses the sweatshirt in the dryer, feeling the alarming uh, currents of memory in your bloodstream. You're sure there must be something you forgot to do. You continue to feel Rose weird as Rose hits the dryer button and nothing happens. Fuck. She hits the button a few more times as if that will make a difference, uh, make a, a bit of difference when the power is out. She presses a thumb and forefinger to the bridge of her nose. Well. <coughs> Excuse me. You aren't going to fit in anything of mine. She leads you down more long, dark hallways. Man, this house is unreasonably huge. You ask Rose if a lot of people live here. No, it's just me, my mother, and a horde of liquids. Not so, uh, so... Oh my god, I can't read tonight. Solable? 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 I know what that word means. In water. Here, try not to drip on the carpet. You aren't sure how uh, you're supposed to manage that, but okay. Oh, is this Roxanne's room? The curtain or the room is large and dark where Rose parts the curtain or the room is large and dark where Rose parts the parts of the curtains. A large flash of lightning illuminates a four poster bed, a long counter and a shelf covered head to toe or head to foot in bottles. Rose vanishes through another door, leaving you to peruse. This is yep. This is all liquor. Shit. This is a lot of booze. Here, I'm not sure what you would want to wear, but this should work until the power comes back on and we can dry your clothes. Rose hands you a long silk robe. She won't miss this. I don't think she's ever even worn it. She has this whole closet full of fantastic clothes and she never puts them on. You take the robe and go into the large master bathroom. It's kind of a mess. The tub looks like it hasn't been cleaned in a long time. The robe gives you the same knotted feeling of familiarity that looking at your hoodie did, but you put it on anyway. It's a relief to get it out of your, it's a relief to get out of your wet clothes. You hang them carefully on the shower rod. Chris, oh, Merp. Uh, hi, Merp. <laughs> you mean you want to say something? That was probably an older message, though. Maybe I missed something. When you head back out into the room, you find Rose standing in the front of or in front of the wall with a uh, in front of the wall of the liquor. She's holding a bottle of Grey Goose and squinting at the label like she's trying to read nutrition facts. You just gone as soon as Willow said who the hoodie was. Oh, <laughs> I like closed the window. Yeah, 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 I closed the window. <laughs> Whoops. I've often wondered what the merits, or I've often wondered what exactly the merits of consuming this are. It tastes quite literally like burning. It's funny, I had, um, what was that, what, what did they just call? Um, a white goose. Um, I didn't have exactly this, but, um, because me and my dad, because I just turned, I turned 21 a few months ago. And when I was home with my dad, we tried a bunch of drinks, or he, he gave, gave me a bunch of alcohol to try. And, um, uh, I don't think I tried White Goose, but I tried, he said that I, I got to try something similar to it. But he brought up White Goose. Grey Goose, sorry, not White Goose, Grey Goose. The diamond on the bottom, Moira else. You, <laughs> you are so ill, and I am too. And you just see, I love how you see diamond, and you're like, oh my god, Moira else. It tastes quite literally like burning. She opens the bottle before you can protest that she is in by no means legal drinking age in wherever the fuck you wherever the fuck you are. She puts the bottle to her mouth and takes a sip. She splutters. Ugh, that's terrible. You could have told her that straight vodka isn't for the uninitiated, even fancy vodka. You take the bottle from her. She hesitates for a moment, then lets it go. You set it back on the shelf. This is really uh, quite an impressive liquor cabinet, liquor wall, liquor room. Her mom must really have a, defi a refined palate. Don't strain yourself. You can say it. What's the point of mincing words? She's a fucking alcoholic. 
Wow, this is intense. You're not sure you're prepared for something this heavy. You were kind of counting on some silly shenanigans. Maybe a couple funny jokes. You aren't counted out for this. You get the feeling that at some point you might have been cut out for this. You might have been, been the sort of person uh, your friends or potential friends could count on. In fact, you know on some level this is true, but whenever you try to nail down any sort of specifics, you just find gape, a gaping lacuna? Lacuna in your experiences. It's all just white noise. Lacuna is such a... You just, you just say hole. Just say a hole. A gaping hole. <laughs> you don't need to be wordy, Homestuck, okay? Fucking relax, Pester Quest. Rose, we put the, put the fucking thesaurus away. Rose's shoulders slump as she stands, surveying her mother's bottles. She doesn't, have the, she doesn't even have the decency to hide her distasteful habits. Who needs an entire wall of liquor bottles? She doesn't have people over. She doesn't have any friends. This is all just from me. Just more of her passive-aggressive act of femme fatale 1950s housewife with, a, housewife with a death wish. It's just like the wizards. Wizards? Don't worry about it. You know how long since it's been? Or you know how long it's been since I've had a home-cooked meal? And I'm not saying that I require or even deserve a lovingly crafted culinary masterpiece every time I sit down to eat. That's going a bit far. I know John complains about being plagued by fatherly concern every chance he gets. He is overwhelmed by pastries whenever he ventures from his room. I'm glad my mother doesn't poke her considerable nose into my private affairs. But I'm sick of eating, eating, oat, of eating oatmeal. Rose. I told you, don't worry about it. But you will worry about it. You worry about all your friends, all two of them. Rose smiles with half of her mouth. It seems she, or it seems to be about all she can manage. Lightning crashes. You look so, or she looks so small and sad against this wall of bottles. You know how to fix this. Thunder rolls and you clench your fist. A friendship clench. You don't know who you are. You don't know why you're here, but you know that surely you have these powers for a reason. And what better than helping out a poor young girl with her troubled home life? Rolling up a floppy sleeve, you get to work. What are you doing? You start with the dark liquors first, and your experiences cause the worst hangovers, and are more likely to contribute to the absence of hot, or hot motherly meals, and over and the overconsumption of oatmeal. You grab two bottles of rum and four, or you grab two bottles of rum and one of bourbon, which you tuck under one armpit. You then zap out of the house into a clearing in the nearby woods a couple hours ago before it started raining. You drop the bottles and go back for more. Are you stealing all of my mother's liquor? Is this your solution to her alcoholism? Don't worry, Rose. You can- or don't worry, Rose can thank you later. Okay, this isn't how you solve this issue. <laughs> You go for the tequila next, then the vodka. Then you get sick of this organized approach and just start grabbing whatever the fuck and dumping it in the past. You watch- Rose watches you do this for a while, then hops up on the counter, crosses her legs, and starts texting. Wow, she is so intent on her conversation that she isn't even noticing you fixing her domestic situation. She keeps giving you little fleeting looks, and you're pretty sure she must be talking about you. You should just let her talk. It isn't right to try and invade your friend's privacy. You attempt to resist the temptation, which you fail at immediately. Not even an overused meme can save you. You zap behind her onto the counter where you can spy on her private correspondence. I don't know anything about them. I'm sorry. Sigh. And here was me trying to take advantage of your uncanny ability to make guesses verging on the prog- Okay, this is Rose talking, so the thesaurus makes sense. Prognostication? I'm recently cons re or I'm recently considering a reevaluation on magic. Mm, you don't know who this person is. Maybe you should just... You go back in time a couple minutes to when Rose started her conversation. Your past self is busily zapping back and forth carrying liquor bottles. You hunker down so you don't see yourself and cause a paradox or whatever the fuck. Out of morbid curiosity to shine a light on my future, I come with a metaphorical hat in hand to ask you to consult your dream clouds. Do you happen to know anything about a, a strange cardboard cutout creature masquerading as a mailman? Are you sleeping? Sorry, I had to scold. Or I had to scold. I saw, for some reason, I read this as betches. I was like, is 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 Jade saying bitches but censoring it? Sorry, I had to scold Beck. He's been acting really weird all of a sudden. Anyway, what's this, uh, is this the same ma mailman that John was talking about? The fake one who's hung out with him? That's the one. They are currently emptying my mother's liquor cabinet in an attempt to prevent her from overindulging herself. Oh, are they drinking it? No, I think they're just dropping it off into the woods with their magic powers. Oh, hmm. Do they know that she could just go out and buy more liquor? That's something that you can do where you live, right? 
Yes, well, not exactly where I live. I think the nearest boozery is a good 20 minute drive. I'm not exactly entirely sure where my mother got it all. We don't own a car as far as I know. Sometimes it just seems like she has the ability to just make things appear. I don't know anything about them, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I... Shit. Um, I'm pretty sure... Oh, fuck. Oh, no. I'm still pretty sure magic is fake, at least the kind of magic you were talking about. And there's probably some real magic out there somewhere. Yes, for instance, the sort that let you spy on your hostess's private correspondence while you are stealing her mother's libations. You freeze. With a contrite zap, you reappear in front of Rose. She sets her phone down and props her chin up on a delicate fist. Sorry, you honestly don't know what you got into. You couldn't resist using your powerful evil. Haven't you heard of... Uh, haven't you heard that great power comes with great responsibility? Rose is right. She's totally right. You've only had this power for like a day and you still aren't used to the idea of being able to just zap all over the narrative. Clearly, clearly you did not appreciate the implications. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking about the implications now. Um, yeah, there's no wonder that Ultimate Dirk is going to show. I, all I know is that Ultimate Dirk shows up because uh, this involves some of that blog stuff. And so the idea that Reader has the ability to pop all over the, the narrative is something that I think is gonna either piss Ultimate Dirk off or he's gonna be really interested in how Reader does it. Uh, cause that's like Ultimate Dirk's whole whole shtick, whole thing is controlling the narrative, so I'm kinda interested to see how that goes. Clearly, you do not appreciate the implications. Sapping all over the narrative sounds potentially stressful. Oh, you bet. You are incredibly stressed right now. Rose laughs. You apologize for stealing all of her mom's drinks. That was kind of overzealous of you. No, I actually, I thought it was hilarious. I've never really been one for pranks. There's, er, that's always fallen more in John's wheelhouse, but there's nothing wrong in the occasion, in occasionally stepping outside of one's comfort zone. Let's do the vodka next. The two of you work, uh, the two of you working together gets the place cleared up out pretty quick pretty quickly. You zap Rose along with you to the bright clearing in the field, and for a moment she stands in the sunbeam, blinking at the cloudless sky. Her expression says she still not, she still might not be totally convinced any of this is happening. When all the liquor has been transferred from the bedroom of woods or the bedroom to the woods, in a big glittering dragon's horde of booze, you and Rose fall down next to it in a messy heap. Well, you fall into a, into a mess. You fall into a messy heap. Rose lowers herself daintily, sitting more on her knees than her butt, probably to keep her skirt from getting dirty. You get the idea that she does live in that, even though she does live in the middle of nowhere, she doesn't spend a lot of time outside. You tell her again that you're sorry you spied on her correspondence with the green field or the green friend GG. You also hope she isn't going to get in or she isn't going to get in trouble with her mom. I'm not unduly concerned. I'll tell her where it all is in the next couple days, although by that time I'm sure at least a good third of it will be water damage. I'm sure this will have fantastic implications for our relationship, and not at all exacerbate the emotional problems underlying her addiction. You laugh awkwardly. Well, now you just feel kind of like an asshole. Rose lies back on the grass and raises a hand to trace the curves of the fluffy white clouds. She closes her eyes. Perhaps it's just like a project or perhaps it's just a projection on my part or wishful thinking. But ever since I met you, I feel like something has changed. Or rather, something has failed to change, if that makes any sense. It's probably nothing. Her eyes flicker back open, endlessly purple, fixed on the sky like she can see something beyond it. And once again you feel there's something really crucial that you forgot. But at least you've made a new friend, and you think and even if you don't think that Rose's brand would ever allow her to call you as such, you're lying in a sunny clearing next to a pile of alcohol, and honestly, it doesn't get much friendlier than that. Aww, look at them! Aww, look at all the booze! That was a good route. I think we have either two more or one more to go with Rose. Oh. Um... No. Right? We, we did yes before. Man, you guessed today is the day you get owned by teens. She is totally right. What are you doing just wandering up to her house without even calling first? She's totally disrespectful of her time. No need to self-flagellate. It was simply a suggestion to more critically examine your motivations and actions in the future. No, no, she's right. You're going. You... <laughs> what? 
You zap away, aiming for a spot a half a mile away into the woods, where you can become properly soaked and miserable. But instead of a tree, you find yourself standing in front of a bank of computers. Shit, you misfired. Wait, you remember seeing a big structure off in the distance when you were in front of Rose's house. You figured it was just some sort of office building, but this looks more like a factory or a, a secret research lab. The computer shows coordinates on a screen that don't mean anything to you. A countdown clock is frozen on 413, and all this has the trappings of a tableau someone set up for you to see. Turning away from the screens, you wander down a long line of gleaming science fiction equipment. It reminds you of pictures of old computers from the 1950s, the ones that took up entire rooms. You bet you could go back and visit some of those if you zapped hard enough. You wander through a whole maze or a whole maze of halls and wide echoing rooms that aren't pictured because our art budget is only so big, but it takes uh, but take it as a certainty that they are all very mysterious. Eventually, you circle back to that strange bank of screens. Nervously, you hit a few keys, tap a few fingers against the readouts. Nothing. It's all locked down. You think that you could, uh, that if you could only get these screens to unlock, you could unravel the secrets to life, the universe, and everything. Or maybe it's all your, me or maybe it's your memories you are trying to unlock. Maybe then you'll understand the seething waters of this endless ocean of time and space intertwining in the meow, uh, meow, meow. <gasps> you turn around, expecting a cat, and you do get a cat, a very adorable black kitten, tiny and soft, with far more eyes than a cat should have. Aww. But the cat isn't the only one thing here. <gasps> oh my god! Actually, I didn't actually think we would see a Roxanne sprite. Oh my goodness, hi Roxanne. Oh my god, she's so pretty. <laughs> Hello, oh my goodness. Your hand? A woman in a sleek lab coat and, a sens and sensible heels holds the cat, pinning you into the spot with her gaze. Or at least you assume she is. Her hair is in her, in her eyes, and the light is behind her, so all you can see of her face are her painted lips. Uh, sorry ma'am, you absolutely didn't mean to trespass in her secret science lab, and you actually aren't even lying. You really did just fuck up this time. The lady puts the cat down slowly, where it rolls on its back and bats a paw playfully in the air. <laughs> Excuse me. Aw, cats are great. Even mutant cats. Maybe especially mutant cats? This little guy should have a name. Hmm, you think you'll name him them Cryptid McWhiskers? Yeah, Cryptid McWhiskers is a great name. In fact, you can't imagine anyone ever naming this cat anything else. That is Jaspers, okay? Reader, shut the fuck up. Hey, learn your lore, okay? I thought you knew the lore now, okay? We, it's, it's the it's the homestuck lore. It's Jaspers, okay? Just fuck up. You hold out a hand to a Jaspers and wriggle wriggle your fingers. It rolls onto its back or onto its feet and saunters over to you. It is soft and fluffy as it looks, and its four eyes blink up at you with utter trust. At least this kitty will be your friend. The ominous clack of heels on cement reminds you that you and Cryptid McWhiskers are not alone. Jaspers are not alone. While you are busy with the kitty cat, the very intimidating and well coughed, coiffed lady has walked over to the bank of the screens. I think Jasper did. Let me look. Jasper. Homestuck. Oh, Jasper only had two eyes. Oh, but, well. Is it a different kitty? Wait a minute. Oh, it is a different kitty, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, according to Google, this is a vodka mutini. I actually don't remember this kitty. I don't remember. She 
She presses a finger, and it must have some sort of a fingerprint recognition or retinal scanning. Or maybe she's just better at things than you are, because it works for her. On the floor a few feet from you is a round gray protrusion, a platform on the floor. You saw it earlier, but you had no idea what it was for, so you just ignored it. What you don't understand can't hurt you, right? You think that's probably right. The intimidating lady presses a button on the screen and the mouth, uh, mouth turning at the corners. <gasps> oh my god, pumpkin! A flash and a pop, like a pressure in the room changes. You feel it in your eardrums. A pumpkin appears on the round gray platforms. Fuck. Hmm, you aren't really sure what she's trying to say here. Making a pumpkin appear out of thin air is impressive, but it probably would have been more so if you hadn't just been popping in and out of existence all day. It's gonna take more than a pumpkin to impress you. Pumpkin. What pumpkin? <laughs> Whoa, what the fuck? The lady shakes her head and hits another button. The pumpkin vanishes and in its place is a tiger. Yeah, you heard that right. A whole ass tiger. Orange and black, big teeth and paws. For a second or two, you just look at each other. Honestly, the tiger might be more shocked than you are. Kind of sucks to think about. One second you're just chilling on the savannah, mauling antelopes, drinking at a watering hole, and the next you're in a secret lab in upstate New York, staring down a very unappetizing looking protagonist. Apparently you are appetizing enough for it to want to get a taste, though, because it looks, <laughs> it looks from you to cryptid McWhiskers and back again. Then it charges. You try to book it out of there. The lady in the lab coat looms up in front of you. She's saying something. You strain to hear her. The tiger is right behind you. The lady or the tiger? At the last minute, you remember you have magic powers, and you choose the third option, teleporting the fuck out of there. Oh no, not again. You just zapped into a yet another unknown building. Although, from the view out the window, you think it might be Rose's house. Also, the fact that Rose turns a corner in the hallway and stops short, still in her rain gear. Her eyes are very wide. You wave awkwardly. That snaps her out of it. She stands straight, sliding easily from shock to superiority. So you thought you'd let yourself in. After wasting my time mumbling about the mail, a gaudy display of manipulative self-recrimination, and then popping out of existence to leave me asking myself if I'd lost my mind. You hadn't meant to do any of that, especially not that last part. She isn't losing her mind, unless both of you are losing your minds together. Rose looks at you. Finally, she seems to decide that you are for real. Your predilections toward the mailman mimicry weren't all that John told me about. Oh. He also said that you had certain powers. Uh, okay, we already read this. She's still got her umbrella open. Hey, doesn't she know that's bad luck? Luck is also fake as hell. You say you can do magic. Prove it. But she just saw you vanish out in front of your yard. Like I said, I could be losing my mind. She could be losing it now, at this very minute, but you see no point in arguing. You hold a hand out, and after a moment of hesitation... Should I picture my room? She's still thinking you're fucking with her. Okay, then we're back in the bedroom. Really did that. Oh, and we're back to this. Oh, we looped it. Um, stay put. So now we just do the stay put route. Your patience pays off almost at once. Rose is back and looking significantly more put together. Also, she's brought you a towel. Here. I'm not overly attached to anything in here. It's mostly just ridiculous, or it's mostly just childish nonsense. I haven't yet bothered to rid myself of, but I'd appreciate it if you try not to drip on any of my notebooks. She's changed out of her raincoat and boots and is dressed in a neat black shirt and or a neat black skirt and a white shirt with a purple blob thing with tentacles. What is it these days and or what is it with kids these days in their blob shirts? Now that that's dealt with, please sit down. She crosses her legs. You suddenly feel you're at a job interview. Friend interview. You wish you were a little less damp. Actually, let's switch places. Uh, you're still pretty wet. You don't want to get her bedspread messed up. Don't worry about it. That's what washing machines are for. Now, let's talk about magic. Which, up until now, I always had taken for granted as being something confined to storybooks. Rose takes a wistful look toward her bedroom window, grayed over and blurry, or blurry with raindrops. You get the feeling that what she's doing, or that she's doing it for effect. Maybe that's why she wanted to switch places, or wanted you to switch places with her. And then comes you, the not a mailman with a penchant for showing up and attempting to make friends with unwitting children. Well, fair, she got you there. But honestly, she might be a child, or, but honestly, she might be a child, but. She really doesn't seem to be unwitting. On the contrary, she's really quite witting. witty. I'm glad you noticed. 
She folds her hand and clears her throat. You think that if she had any notes, she would be shuffling them. And so, the question remains, are you a good witch, or a bad witch, or are you a wizard? We've already established that you are not a public servant. Is there a difference between a witch and a wizard? Of course there is, but exactly how specific of a difference can vary. According to some works of fiction, a wizard is just a witch's male counterpart. But in certain mythologies, for instance, Arthur, um, Arthurian, Arthurian, Arthur, Arthurian. That's, that's probably not the way you say it, I'm, I'm fucking that up. Arthurian legend. The difference appears to be class-based. Wizards reside at court and are classically trained, while witches are self-taught and run wild through the forest. I won't deny that those differences tend to often be gendered as well. You ask her which one she is, a witch or a wizard. Me. Rose, Rose shifts and, crossing her, and recrossing her legs. You shrug and say that she seems to know a lot about them. I know a thing or two, but can I tell you a secret? Oh my god, Rose. You have no idea how much you would love to hear her secret. Hi, Endyrian. No, Ender, Enderian, Enderian, not Enderian, Enderian, I guess Endear, Ender, Ender, en Ender, Ender, I'm gonna say Ender. <laughs> Hi Ender, it's been a little bit. I find them, wizards I mean. I said it right the first time, Enderian? Okay. Enderian. I guess Enderian, Enderian, either way it is. Utterly reprehensible. They disgust me. Everything from their foppish robes to their grizzled beards. It's my mother who is the wizard enthusiast in this house. Although, she glances from side to side theatrically. Most of the things Rose does seem to, or most of the things Rose does seem to be at least a little bit theatrical. Most of the things Rose does. Oh, most of the thing Rose does seems most of the things rose does seem that should be seems right seems to be at least a little bit theatrical she kneels on the carpet besides the clutter of books i don't show these to many people actually i haven't shown them to anyone not even john john seemed to be a pretty cool guy definitely a guy worth sharing a few secret notebooks with rose laughs no i haven't shown them to john and i've only shown strider to punish him <laughs> You nod, pretending that you know who the Strider person is. You are a totally normal dude with an absolutely ungodly number of friends. A shadow moves to the center of you, a trembling moment of deja vu. You you do have a lot of friends, don't you? That feels true, but only people you know here on, the only people you know here are John and now Rose. Weird. You try to put it to uh, you try to put put it to you try to put it to from your mind, and listen to Rose again. She's still talking about this mysterious strider, flipping through one of the journals, too quickly for you to see anything specific, only that it is full from cover to cover. As if my modest writings are the sole source of, hem <laughs> of homoerotic tension in his life, when his brother is the one who insists on filling their home with a sort of dick, buck di dick butt for ironic purposes. Rose rolls her eyes. Oh boy, you missed the beginning of that. It is probably way, way more sense than it seemed like. Rose is searching through her notebooks, checking markings on the spine that seem to be a sort of cataloging system of arcane symbols. Where is... Oh, right. Heading out for today. See you all uh, around later sometime and happy new year. No worries, Ellipti. Hope you have a nice rest of your night or day. If you're heading out for the day, it's probably day for you. <laughs> so have a happy new year. She does something quick and complex with her fingers, and another notebook pops into- I don't know why I'm speaking in Rose's voice- into existence and falls into her lap. You gate. She really is a wizard. What? It's just a syllabex. A child could use one. Here. This notebook has a couple of drawings in it, but most of it's filled with small, neat handwriting in lavender ink. Is Rose writing a book? No, don't be silly. I'm writing four books, at least. <laughs> Five, depending on whether I decide to flesh out Calmasis' backstory. It isn't strictly necessary, but it does add a certain va uh, amount of valuable character insight, which renders their actions in the later volumes more sympathetic. Not that I need all of my anti-heroes to be sympathetic. I'm just thinking of what the literary reviewers would say. You nod. Smart. You would never have thought of what the literary reviewers would say. She's honestly pretty impressive for someone her age. Age has nothing to do with it, with it but don't get carried away. It's only a rough draft. You ask her if you can take a look. She hesitates, but you doubt she would have shown it to you if she didn't want you to look. What the hell? 
if you can't trust a strange seer, uh, oh. if you can't tr trust a strange spherical imprint you just met outside in the rain, who can you trust? Why is she talking like a fanfic author? I say as a fanfic author, Rose, do you have something you want to tell us? <laughs> it's for real. I am not writing one fan- but don't be silly. I am not writing one fanfiction. I am writing 20 fanfiction, all at the same time. Right? Your thoughts exactly. You hand Rose the notebook and open it at random, letting fate guide your hands. Friglish bothered his beard, as if unkinding a hitch in a long silk windsock. A more pedestrian audience would parse the, ex the exhibit as nervous compulsion, behavior to petition contempt among the reasonable. He was, however, not surrounded by the reasonable, but the wise. A distinction in men that would forever be the difference in history's garland of treasured follies. As a matter of fact, his catter, his catter, his cad, his cadre, his cad, his cadre of fellow wizards were all putting similar moves on their beards as well. The practice would invite thoughtfulness, sagacity, sagacity, even if they didn't do it all the time. Standing in the line of the banks, shooing squirrels from the bird feeders, few occasions were safe. Zazarpan inspected the clue, a single piece of evidence cradled in his coraceous old man palms. It was a human bone, not striking in the tail it told alone, so much as it, so much as that told by thousands like it, festooning the marshy soil of the mass grave. The grisly expanse bore the texture of the decadent desert, like one of Marnie's formidable custard trifles wobbled out of the wheel for the holidays to the dismay of a small nation. You're certain of this? asked Friglish. Despite what he's what he was doing with his beard, he was in fact immersed in meaningful contemplation. I'm afraid I am becoming more so with each terrible tick or er, tick groused by the gaudy timepiece slung around your neck. In case it wasn't clear, Friglish wore a clock Sazerpan didn't care for. It was magic. The massacre of Scissor of Sears and Nelf was not as written. Wow, this is pretty dense, but smart. You stroke your own imaginary beard and pretend to ponder the deeper meaning. Hmm, yes, intriguing. Sazerpan and Friglish. But clearly, there is some history there. Yes, clearly. But what the two of them shared went beyond simple romance. That's why it had gone so spectacularly sour. Rose's, Rose becomes increasingly more animated as she tells you about her gay wizard OCs. <laughs> like she is far more interested in them than she is herself. <laughs> God damn. I feel like I'm being called out. Oh my god. Oh my god. These gay wizard OCs. Please tell me more. Though I could never be in love with gay wizard OCs. I am in love with gay... <laughs> gay homestuck boys. <laughs> from pre-established pieces of content. I am established... I, I like gay boys from fandoms. They share an intellectual bond, a mutual dedication to knowledge and the preservation of such. The goal of the learned is to amass their wisdom and keep it from the general decimation to the main populace of wizards. They feed it to the apprentices in drips and drabs. Of course, this will eventually lead to ruin. Of course, you flip further in the book, searching for the part where it leads to ruin. Ruin sounds interesting. Sazerpan knew he would see his wayward apprentice again, knew it like he knew the tide would turn and the sun would blaze to its zenith as each inexor in inexorable day passed. Now they stood diametrically opposed across the overgrown chessboard. His apprentice's eyes were hidden behind dark glasses, but Sazerpan knew if he could see them, they would be riddled with the madness of void. Calamasis wasn't here for justice or revenge. They were here exclusively because Zazerpan had something they wanted, something they were owed. You flip through the notebook, checking out the drawings. There are a lot of wizards, each more bearded and vulnerable than the last. One of the pictures, the most recent, maybe since it's on the very last page of the journal, is of two young wizards, twins maybe. They have gray hair and are wearing slick green suits and are standing back to back with their arms entwined and staring into the middle distance. It's very anime. You compliment Rose on her artistic prowess. Yes, thank you. They're all right. I'm much better of a writer than I am an artist. 
You tell her you think she's really good, way better than you. You're absolutely positive she's going to be famous one day. I appreciate the encouragement, even though I know you're just trying to flatter me due to your strange thirst for affirmative experiences. John told me all about that. Damn, busted. But you do really think she's talented. It's fine. I, it's not as if uh, my social calendar is over full out here in the middle of the woods. Don't tell anyone I said that I don't have many friends. And don't tell them that I've been drawing. He'd be insufferable. He? Never mind. <gasps> oh, you assure Rose that her secrets are safe and you hand back her journal. You were really excited about your new friend and if you might be so bold, or if you might be so bold and her wizard stories, although, wait, hadn't she said she hated wizards? What's your point? Well, you're no expert on wizards or on Rose, but it seems like she actually does seem to like them because she has several notebooks full of wizard fiction. You aren't trying to get, like, real here, but maybe it's possible her mom isn't the only one in the family who likes wizards. Rose pulls her, pulls her book out of your hands. That and the rest of the books vanish into thin air. Oh, right, that must have been what... What had she called it? Silidex? She doesn't look angry exactly, but the line around her mouth and eyes that softened as she talked about her book have hardened back up. Her eyes glitter menacingly. Oh, is that right, Freud? Well, why don't you diagnose me? Oh, hey, wow, you weren't trying to be condescending or whatever. Clearly. Were you aware that it is a common psychological phenomenon to, for an individual to react to trauma by creating fictional representations of that which has caused them bodily harm or emotional dismay? To suggest that the portrayal of these fictional renderings somehow condones them or supports them is absolutely absurd. So what she's saying is she draws wizards to cope. Rose rises regally to her feet. The lightning turns her into an ethereal silhouette. What I'm saying is that I don't need to justify my fictional predilections to you or to anyone else. No, no, she's totally right. You're sorry that you suggested she might like wizards. It was a horrible presumption and not at all the way a friend should act. You are so, so sorry. You promise you will never happen again. No, I don't suppose it will. It's probably just because Rose's hair is such a pale blonde, but it almost looks like she's glowing in the dim bedroom, like light behaves a little differently around her than it does on everything else. Would you look at that? It appears the rain has lightened up a bit. The rain is hitting the window so loudly you're actually having a hard time hearing her. And your point is? You can just sap yourself out there to where the weather is drier. Fuck off. Oh shit. <laughs> Damn, Rose. Ooh, that one ended poorly. Go zap yourself. Oh, this isn't... Doesn't this mean that they never play Spurb, which means fit, uh, Fish Bitch invades? Oh yeah, I guess so, right? But we also have a route with, like, the Alpha Kids. So I don't know how they exist on this world as well. I guess we'll figure that out. Alright, we're gonna do Dave and then I'll probably end stream. Even though it'd be nice if I could do all the beta kids, I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get, my voice is starting to get tired. But I do want to do Dave very badly. <laughs> I would very badly like to do Dave. But after that, I think, I think we'll dip. I think I'll go. Dave time, Mr. Strider. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Let's be real. As much as you enjoy your new friends, they all seem a little lonely. Like... Maybe they don't have any friends besides the ones they talk to online? Is online friendship a reasonable alternative to a more traditional face-to-face -face friendship? Are relationships and, dare you say, families that you choose not just as important, if not more so, than, than those you are able to touch and feel? Damn, maybe being a little too real. You decide not to think about it too hard. But if you're being honest with yourself, maybe you aren't terribly interested in the greater context of found family and interpersonal relationships in this instant message era. You've got a fever, and the only cure for this disease is called friendship. Uh, or, and the only cure for this disease called friendship is to mildly inconvenience a few teenagers. As much of a delight as it's been to make a young boy face his existential future, rob a woman of her boostache, and then self-reflect about the value of the contextual relationships. This all felt a little heavy-handed. What you need is an emotional palate cleanser. There are two kids left on this tour de force, uh, and both sound like they would make exquisite friends. Time to go full-on easy mode here. You've heard so much about this guy, you feel like you got this one in the goddamned bag. With confidence, you zap yourself onwards. What am I looking at? Oh, you're already here. Wherever here is, 
Oh, I love this OST so much. Wherever here is, it is blisteringly hot. You nigh instantaneously regret your choice of approval or of apparel. Why did you instinctively put your hoodie back on over this robe gown? You the mailman or male person? This must be Dave. Rose mentioned he talked a lot and you start to explain er, and as you start to explain it becomes apparent he is having this conversation at you, not with you. Wow, it is unbelievably human. Person adjacent. Anyway, Egbert told you or Egbert told me to show up. I had to find a Dave voice. My 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 Dave voice my Dave voice is just me, but like cooler. Is that possible? I don't know how to become cooler. Anyways, Egbert told me you'd show up eventually. Which I never doubted for a second since one of the core tenets of the United States Postal Service is that you could visit four extremely specific and spread out teenagers while sweating all over yourself. Practically a crime to not be increasingly moist while out here delivering letters on the roof of a sky rise. Which, as you know, is the most effective and legal way to drop off the post. Clammier than the New England potluck and wandering around on the roof with no package. It is actually really cool how uh, how much this kid seems to talk at you, but you are barely listening. Has the sun always been that red? Has the sky always been that wavy? Uh, are you all right? You are hardly all right. You tug at the collar of your soggy mess of a hoodie. This is an overwhelming, oppressive heat, and almost impenetrable air fills your lungs as you try to take a series of shallower and shallower breaths. The world fades to white. Oh my god. When you wake up, you're sitting propped up on a cheap futon in, a f in front of a large television. A rough approximation of a person does an elaborate series of controlled falls culminating in what you can only describe as skateboarding for assholes. On your left, Dave exists in a quantum state that is both somehow sitting and laying down, but also neither. With the precision of a Swiss watchmaker, he deftly presses a series of buttons that makes the awful polygon man on the screen T-pose and fall face forward onto the ground. Seconds later, his skateboard flops helplessly next to him. He doesn't look away from the screen as he speaks. So, uh, guess you lived. Not that I'm invested, but John might be sad. Classic John, you try to emulate his incredibly casual body language as you slide your body down on the futon. Your legs have already barely reached the ground. Uh, yeah, that guy's a dork, but I taught him everything he knows. You ask him if you taught if he taught him how to be a dork. You affect a completely uninterested face, as though the sickness of your third degree burn is not the single most exciting moment of your life. God damn. Owned in my own house. Owned with an inch of my life. I am on the edge of reaching out that hand of friendship and um this chucklehead long live the king's me. Thousands of gazelles trample my useless body as Jonathan Taylor's Thomas's as Jonathan Taylor Thomas's fursona watches on. Who will raise Simba now? Who's gonna teach him about combat? Philosophy. Life. By the way, I put your nasty sweater sh or sweatshirt in the shower. The shower? Dope dope dope. <laughs> Dope, 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 dope. You are definitely the sort of person who says dope often and casually. You tell him dopely that you are a person who is not caught up in the small details of the decorum or personal property. In fact, it doesn't bother you at all that he took your only worldly possessions and tossed them in a shower while you were unconscious. What's some light corpse looting among bros? Huh, okay. While it dries, you can wear one of my bros shirts. He usually has a fresh stash hidden in here. Dope, tight, sick, nothing weird about having or hiding some shirts in the living room. Just gonna have a look -sees. holy shit, there are a lot of puppets in here. Yeah, dude, puppet zone. Enough said. My bro's got a market cornered on puppet-based endeavors. Backed up against the wall like a feral beast hissing for more plush-oriented content. Little guy's probably just scared. Just, uh, just wants to protect its nest and mouth-to-mouth -mouth feed its babies. Only the choicest puppet smut for a reasonable fee. What the fuck does any of that mean? You look back at Dave, but he's on his phone. God damn, that is so cool, actually. <laughs> There's something weird about this whole setup that you can't just put a finger on. For one, you can't seem to find any secret shirt anywhere. It's all just puppets and plushes and DJ equipment. Oh my. Yeah, my bro, uh, yeah, with my bro, you have to think of the potential for ironic payoff. That guy's always one step ahead. Just when you think you've got it figured out, it was all some trap to make you think you'd gotten his goat. But that goat is long gone. 
makes you think maybe there was never a goat. Maybe it was just some other barnyard animal all along. You've been duped into looking for a goat like some dumb asshole. Or maybe the goat gets you really subvert- or maybe the goat really- or maybe the goat gets you really subvert the whole thing. You take a second to wonder if he really is using the term ironic correctly in this instance. By dictionary definitions, yes, a goat getting you is the opposite of how a situation should go. Thank god that's settled. As you're about to reassure Dave that this joke tracks, you catch some camera or some movement in the corner of the room, uh, in the corner of your eye. Was that a camera? It couldn't have possibly been a camera. Oh, nope, there it is again. There is a camera coming out of the ice dispenser. It whirs softly as you approach, its mechanical eye trained on yours, or trained on you. How long has this thing been watching? Is it Dave's? You lean in and take a closer look, but your foot catches on something and you fall flat on your face. Dave seems too engrossed in the conversation he's having on his phone to pay attention, or uh, to pay you much mind, occasionally mumbling something out loud a few times before presumably typing it out. You search for whatever it was that made you beef it so royally, you know. Beef it, like fall down. That is a real phrase that humans say. A small tripwire stands taut a few inches off the ground. You must have dist you must not have disturbed it enough to set it off to whatever contraptions it's attached to, apparently. Oh yeah, sometimes they're more of a psych out. You think, oh fuck me, I definitely beefed it, which is a phrase that is real. And you sit there waiting on bated breath, prepared for fuck or prepared to be fuck deep in velvety marinette dick. And it never comes. You go the rest of your day just waiting for the payoff from your dipshit mistake. And it never comes. You wake up in cold sweats for weeks yearning for the release that will never find you and it hits you. You've been fucking bamboozled by the master yet again. There is no elaborate booby trap. No rude Goldberg device set to enact a series of complicated shenanigans ultimately resulting in the being buried alive in a Kermit of- or in- Kermit the Frog plush ambiguous or amphibious dong. Beautiful, really. Damn, bro, you live like this? I mean, yeah, I guess. Keeps me on my toes. Heels never met the ground. A prima ballerina with a head full of dreams, nothing to lose. God's gift to, to plies, ripping a straight, tasty tour on lair for my adoring fans. They go apeshit for this sort of thing, but it just but it's just another day in life for Donsor extraordinaire Dave Strider. Haven't fallen for a trap like that since I was a baby. Drained. Real rookie mistake mailman looking tired, maybe. Drained. Oh my god, he is mumble rapping at you. This is the greatest day of your life. Got a mere plush ass than a puppet lost and found. King Strider drops the illest fires. Cause heavy is the crown. Rhyming puppet with puppet. Call that puppet rhymes. <laughs> Killing all ventriloquists. Puppet on puppet crimes. He goes on like this for a while, <laughs> sometime with what could be described as bars of a similar caliber. The narrative focus shifts on your inner thoughts out of necessity because it turns out writing raps is really hard. He isn't exactly great, but you're not really a rap expert despite what your social media opinions might imply. Unless you count, unless you count ha uh, hatched, hatched to dance, which of course you do, why wouldn't you? Wait, wait, what? What does that mean? Why'd you think that? The whole scenario feels a little weird and familiar to you. All of these kids feel familiar to you. You learn something about, or you knew, you learn something new about Dave, and you feel like you already sort of know it. You can't place it, despite having met Dave for no less than half an hour. Something feels just slightly off about him. Something about his actions so, or feels so performative in nature, like he's pantomiming in front of an audience. As Dave continues to rap, you remember that you are in front of an audience. You cast a glance over to the camera, but you but also to the hundreds of stuffed little creatures staring at you with their lifeless eyes. Amidst the revelation, we check back in on Dave because I'm getting paid to write this, so I should have probably- so I should probably make with the fucking jokes already. <laughs> Master of my tool, I'm the ace. Hardware. Got more hose than a gardener. Yard care. Nice. The chaotic and surreal energy of this scene sends a shock of nervous energy down your spine. You feel alarmingly nude without the comfort of your familiar and warmth, uh, and the warmth of your sweater. There's something about it that grounded you, something that felt like home. Dave concludes his masterpiece with an elaborate series of yeahs and uhs, just as you see the camera turn away from him ever so slightly to focus on something else before retreating back into the ice dispenser. It almost makes it look a little bashful. That's kind of adorable, actually. Despite the fanfics you've written in your head about a cool kid and his new best robot friend, the reality of the situation sits in. You have yet to make friends with this character, and it all has kind of felt surreal and weird to you. Maybe it's time to zap back 
and hard reset this continuity and try again. What does that mean? Feels like I'm missing an important part of the puzzle here. Uh, did he hear, hear that? How does that work exactly? Sometimes you just narrate what you're thinking. Kind of a baller move. Why has nobody called you out on this before? You put your hand on the counter to stabilize yourself and your fingers brush up against something clandestinely polo. Just barely poking out from beneath a pile of discount plush nobodies is a neatly retail folded shirt. Wear the shirt. Don't wear the shirt. Wear the shirt. Obviously you're going to put the shirt on. You don't want to be the only one not wearing a cool shirt. Do you need some privacy? I'm not sure where one layer of you ends up and the other begins. Doubt the audience cares. What? Oh, you guess being on camera like this is kind of fucking whack, you say. So pointedly, your sprite even shows up on screen for a second. Yeah, that's right. We went all out for this one. You were wondering if there was a place there wasn't uh, that wasn't under constant surveillance. Like, how does this kid take a shit in peace? You know everyone, er, you know everyone's thinking it. Dope line of questioning that I'm sure the public at large is eager to know the answer to, but my room isn't wired up, no. About to get you fired up, though. <laughs> Menageries multiplying with mit. Maybe not this second. Alright, damn. You accompany Dave down the hallway to his room. You hear the shower on as you pass the bathroom, and you peek in to see your hoodie and uh, nice gown on the tile being uselessly wetted by a low-pressure steam. You're welcome, BT dubs. Dave motions you to go in first, giving you privacy, you, giving you the privacy you need to change into an extremely starched polo shirt and nothing else. This collar will not go down. This is absolutely, or this is absolutely what someone in 2009 would think is fresh as hell. You look around the room for a bit. There are so many things in here. This would be a 13-year-old's wet dream, but to you it seems a little much. This feels uh, like this is a bunch of things that someone thinks they should have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let the fan art reflect that you've put on a shirt at this moment. There isn't a mirror in here, but you can tell this is someone that this is someone out there's idea of a look. You, uh, the door opens and Dave is standing there, but not walking in. He's leaned up against the door frame, sipping a juice. Where do you get the juice from? What the fuck? Hallway juice, my guy. Hallway juice. Why don't you keep the food stuff stashed around your house? Or what? You don't keep the food stuff stashed around? What do you do when you get hungry? No, that's not it. You usually keep it in the fridge or whatever. Too obvious. Somebody help this useless clown. You assure Dave that you have met many clowns in your days, and only some of them are useless. Name one. You can't. Why did you say that? Clowns are awful. Everybody knows this. Guess he's got you there. You know, despite the overwhelming plush and decor of the rest of the house, there is a distinct lack of puppets in here. That's more my bros thing. Not that they aren't deliriously sick. Just a whole hospital ward full of the illest children you've ever seen. Each one more up to the pup than last. Up to pup? Yeah, pup like puppets. You're gonna be honest, it really doesn't seem like his heart's in it. How do you mean? Well, it's just that he doesn't really seem to be all that into puppets. It feels a little performative. Oh, well, I got my own stuff I'm into. Like, if I were to rank it 1 out of 10, I'd say puppets are probably a solid 7. You got this kid on the ropes. Just one more push. In fact, he even goes far to say, as to say the puppet thing sort of sucks. It is extremely weird. The cameras, the hiding things like an animal, it all seems a little, you know, whack. For a while, he just seems to look at you, almost as if he's sizing you up. There's a long stretch where Dave doesn't break eye contact with you as he finishes his cute little juice and crumples it up. He takes an ambitious shot at the trash and misses it by seven and a half feet. <laughs> Damn, I could have sworn I had game. You thrown me off, mailman. Yes, this is correct. You are a faithful employee of the Postal Service. I mean, I definitely believe you, but let's say I didn't. Let's say I had a cool friend who, even though they're too cool to care about the details like this, they were a little skeptical of this whole situation. Maybe they'd want proof you were who you said you were before they let you get any closer to their friends. Just throwing that hypothetical out there. What proof could he possibly need? Say the oath. What? The oath. The male oath. Uh, look, the thing about that is, I mean, unless you aren't really a mailman. Behind his sunglasses, Dave's eyes shift ever so slightly to what you might describe in a less in in immediately harrowing situation as a moderately priced looking mall katana mounted to his wall. You realize that now isn't the best time to come clean about your impeccable ruse. You can't believe you have managed to put yourself in mortal peril again. You wordlessly chuckle and shake your head. 
Oh, the situations you get yourself into. <laughs> Dave, not privy to your private thoughts for once, looks on. Why, of course you can recite the mailman oath. You say it with confidence that is a misplaced as and that is as misplaced as it is unfounded. You perk up. Now it is your time to shine. Maybe it's the popped collar, but you are feeling good about this one. You got this. You've lied to tons of kids. One more and it will be all smooth sailing from here on out. You open your mouth and there's a brief moment where everything feels like it's going to be okay. You immediately start sobbing and crumple into a disgusting mess of the floor. Uh, um, fuck. Uh, okay, wow. Jesus Christ. You're not a male, but you never read. You don't even have a real male, man, man, but you're just a fraud. You don't even know how much the stand cost. Oh my god. Jesus, just. Okay. It's, uh. It's gonna be alright there, uh. Dave squats down next to your deflated body and pats you a little awkwardly on what he assumes is your shoulder. You say you're sorry you tricked him. You just wanted to impress him because John said he was so cool. It's, uh. It's fine, I guess. Fuck, dude. Get a hold of yourself. He tries to get up. Uh, he tries to get up, but you are desperately clinging to his shirt, confessing everything, confessing to made-up crimes you crimes you didn't even commit. Look, my guy, we uh, we all make mistakes. Please stop whatever this is. I'm pretty sure you are harmless, and I don't think you could actually. And I don't think you actually killed anyone with your ass or were ever an accessory to burning down an alien mall or whatever insane shit you just said. Well, we did kill some things with our ass. Yeah, you just kind of caught up in the moment and just started saying made up shit. You ask Dave if he's mad at you. Nah, dude. Get up. Dave helps you back up on your feet. You come clean in an only slightly more controlled and dignified way this time. You explain how are these, how you have these huge gaps in your memory, and that you somehow ended up with these abilities. <sighs> Excuse me. That let you traverse space, time, and sometimes even reality itself. Dave doesn't say much for a change, and it doesn't seem like he's listening at first. But you think maybe he has just one of those faces. Let me get this straight. One day you just appeared in a suburb. No memories, except that you have these mysterious teleportation powers. You dig through some unsuspecting chump's mail looking for clues. And through some ridiculous universal happenstance, you just so happen to stumble upon the most gullible fucking dork in the universe. Befriend him. Also, I'm there via text. Egbert gives you a list of friends to visit. Out of all the choices available to you, myself included, you go see Rose first. Rose fucking Lalonde. Even though we built up such good rapport when I told John you weren't a real mailman. Called it, by the way. Your first instinct is to visit my most heavy-handed of all of us to look for some light kinship. A power move, I guess. Mailman out here wave-dashing for friendship. Can't even spare a neutral for old Strider, huh? Won't even back into the corner and spam your range attack for the D-man. A tragedy in two acts. Both acts are titled Betrayal. <laughs> I love Dave so much. You definitely understand what is being said and you absolutely don't have to ask your friends what some cool video game words are. You are 100% not pulling the boldest how do you do fellow kids the world has ever seen. Besides, is it really the thing to be focusing on right now? You fucking wound me, now man. Of course it is. Nothing is more important to me than this. They say that most humans only use 10% of their brains. That's because I'm using 90% of it to think how dare you. So anyway, you can really go anywhere. See anybody you want. Sounds nice. For all but a moment, the act drops, and you see the corners of his mouth tighten a little. The fading afternoon light filters through the sun through his sunglasses at just enough of an angle to see his eyes shift ever so slightly toward the window. These subtle movements would surely be lost on most, if you weren't so focused on trying to read him, or even just slightly further away, you might have missed it yourself. There was almost a loneliness in his voice. It must have been hard to live here by yourself. So far away from people who care about you. It's possibly, or it's possible that you've been so focused on trying to blindly make friends that you've forgotten that in front of you is a real living person. You can't help but wonder if there is something you can do. You said you can take people with you, right? Like, you could just teleport John around and... Would that work with anybody? This is it. The path to this kid's heart is clear as day. Fuck what you said just now. The friendship juice is so close you can practically fucking taste it. You try not to look excited. Affecting Dave's cool persona as you say, fuck yeah, you can take people with you. You scoop out your fingernails because for some reason, that is what you do when you're acting cool. This works to the full extent it can coming from someone who is not, uh, who not but 7 minutes and 32 seconds ago earlier was rolling around the floor damp with their own tears. Did he have some place in mind? Yeah. I mean, 
I got some ideas I could bounce off you, I guess. How do you feel about... Shh. With a swift finger to his mouth, you cut him off. He didn't seem to like that very much, but you still consider it a successful maneuver. There's no need for words between friends. You just know where he wants to go. Just think really hard about it. Think about where you want to be, Dave. Think about what is important to you. Think about what you really want. It will be more magical this way. Friendship is magic after all. <laughs> you just made that up right now. Don't look it up after. <laughs> Damn, I guess that's true. He closes his eyes and you put a hand on his shoulder. This is it. Putting your trust in the magic of friendship, you focus and power externally as much as you are able. Flashes of distant but somehow familiar imagery course through you. The quiet stillness of the suburbs, the smell of the forest, the heat of, heat of an apartment rooftop, the ocean breeze. You extend it outward as much as you are able. This is his road to you. You are merely the... Vehicle. What the fuck? Oh, fuck yes. The two of you stand near a sign that says, Please wait to be seated. A very cheery hostess has a brief exchange with Dave and ushers the two of you to an open table. Oh, hell fucking yes. There's no mistaking it. Bow to get my motherfucking breadstick on. This is absolutely an olive garden. <laughs> Fuck yes, it is. <laughs> when you're here, you're family, dog. While you're still new to this, you can't really seem to detect any irony in his voice. You thought for sure he'd want to go see his friends. You thought you had him figured out. First and last mistake, mailman. But you'll learn. I'm a mystery. Got that history. Fuck with the plot, my flow so hot they leave you looking blistery. Racially ambiguous, my rhymes conti conti contiguous. <laughs> At the OG with my homie where the breadsticks are continuous. You don't know what the fuck it is, you just let him go for a while. You don't even know what that last one- You don't even know if that last one rhymed, but fuck if you aren't charmed by this little bastard. You lean back in your chair and just absorb it all, sitting in the worst restaurant imaginable with your new rapping teen friend while their patrons do their best to ignore his incredible rhymes. After a short while, Dave abruptly stops freestyling and you open your eyes. Oh fuck, you know what time it is? No, your sprite doesn't have a watch drawn it. It's breadstick 30, no watch necessary. Fuck me, I love breadsticks. I never talk about it. This is very real and hidden character trait that nobody knows about me. Well, that sounds like a very real and hidden character trait that nobody knew about him. And we are certainly not finding this out because of a series of seemingly unrelated events that possibly changed the continuity of this universe, allowing these sort of otherwise narratively unimportant traits to shine through. Wow, he is really going to town on those breadsticks. Maybe this is all friendship needs to be. Spending some quality face time with a solid bro and just absolutely decimating some bottomless breadsticks at a bad chain Italian restaurant. Maybe the real lesson here is friendship doesn't have to be a grand gesture or high adventure. Maybe the friends... I understand you are having a moment, but I am absolutely going to eat your breadsticks if you don't stop talking about what friendship means to you. Uh, yeah, man, whatever you want. <laughs> I've seen this image before, so I knew this was coming. Did not expect us to get it here the way that we did, though. <laughs> oh my god, I love Dave Strider. I think we have two more routes still with him, right? My god. Um, the shower? What, the shower? Yeah, it smelled, so I tossed it in there. Ran the hot water? You can thank me later. Won't someone need that? You don't want to put anyone out. You've also taken up so much of their hospitality. Also, you don't think that's how you're supposed to watch clothes. Nah, bro. Nah, my bro's out for a while. It happens sometimes. Probably puppet related. He avoids the laundry minefield by opting for the nuclear option, though you guess that makes sense. There are a lot of puppets around which strike you as extremely normal and reasonable, and not even a little whack. Yeah, puppets rule and the story. Shit closed the book on that one. Time for Betty by kid. Little man about to get his 8 out of 10 on snug as a bed in a fucking rug. Tuck, tuck the fucking tight as can be on his way to slumberland. Nemo who? Never fucking heard of him. Shit, hold on. He sits up to fish something out of his pocket. Ah, a palm, uh, a phone. He gets a phone from his pocket. You're not sure what you were thinking. As a perfectly normal human, from a 100% real and tangible earth, you know what a cell phone is. What is that, first gen? Yikes. He ignores your jab and you pretend not to be reading over his shoulder, though it probably could not be more obvious that you are. Hi, did you meet my mailman? My guy, we have gone over this time and time again. How do I even put this in terms you can understand? Have you ever met a mailman in your life? Even in the shitty 
Costner flick you love. Uh, the dude has the decency to at least wear the outfit. Ha, I knew you watched it. No, I'd never waste my precious time watching even a single one of those zealous garbages you try to wreck me. I'm just stating stone cold facts. I just see, I just read an outline and browsed a few review sites to see what people were saying. I don't know, it sounds like you probably took a lot more time and effort just to watch the movie itself. What I'm saying is that this isn't a mailman. I don't even think this is a person. You have to thrust a person-styled entity into my life under the alluring guise of parcel delivery. Which, if I'm understanding right, this clown isn't even very good on the account of how bad they bungled the only delivery that mattered. At least Lalonde had a good sense to be skeptical of this absolute fucking tomfoolery. Don't be a dick, the mailman is cool. John, I cannot stress this enough. You wouldn't know cool if it bit you right in the ass. Can you imagine? No. The dopest person you've ever met chomping away, just really getting up in there, ice cold, and ear deep in, king, in a king's feast of ass. What the hell are you talking about? Try to keep up, Egbert. This will be on the quiz. He looks uncharacteristically startled as he glances back in your direction to find you only a few inches away adamantly reading his private conversation with his friend. Jesus Christ, you're like a cat. How, how much of that did you see? You definitely didn't see him having a playfully flirtatious chat with a longtime friend if that's what he's asking you. Dave desperately tries to refocus his game hijinks. He makes his character, who you can see he has named Tony Cock, to <laughs> what could be described as some insane flips and shit. Masterful. There is nothing at all flirtatious about two bros discussing eating ass. <laughs> Yeah, Dave, absolutely nothing. Just being straight as two arrows who are also straight. I mean, how would that even work? I wouldn't, it wouldn't, that's how. That's all there is really to say about that. You reassure him that it is okay to be honest about his feelings. You're not here to judge him. John seems very nice. They would be cute together. Together, like how? No, don't tell me. Actually, I don't even give a single shit about this line of thought. You might have not picked this up, but I'm definitely 100% not a homosexual. Pretty much crawling in the most voluptuous hose on the regular. Wait, hose are real? Hell yeah, hose are real. And they're damp? Shit, it's like I've got to start at square one with this hapless asshole. What school do you go to? The utter astonishment you feel at this earth-shattering revelation sends, a, sends your consciousness for a spin, but you manage to see yourself. This isn't your first tough, tough customer. You tell Dave that hoes is a gender-neutral term, that anyone can be a hoe if they believe in themselves. Hoe-like behavior has no limits, no master. Despite just learning they were real mere moments ago, you are confident that to be a hoe is to be free. Oh, that's pretty dope, I guess. It's not... Um, <laughs> it's not like I've never thought of it. I mean, for the ironic payoff, obviously. Can you imagine the look on his face? His best bro coming up with him with some dire news. I look at him, eyes red with tears as I put a hand on his shoulder and say, John, not to alarm you, but I'm gay now, and your clueless dipshit wiles have finally won me over. Mm, no, that sucks. His speech has become even quicker than normal as he stands and paces frantically around the apartment, completely abandoning his poor Tony. I mean, this is purely hypothetical. <laughs> if I liked anyone, which I don't on the account of being too fucking smooth to not hide myself down. It would probably be another one of my friends. Uh, you don't know she, her, she's not from around here. So that's basically means I can't have a thing. A thing. For John. Case closed. Wow, this is really John Dave heavy. Oh my goodness. I did not expect to get John Dave in my pester quest. Wowzers. This is like actual John Dave. <laughs> Though, okay, here's my, you guys wanna know my, my, my thoughts on John Dave, cause I've been thinking about it a lot recently. As a disclaimer, I'm not a big John Dave fan. Okay, here's why, period comma. That's not how grammar works. Um, I, I don't think that John is gay. <laughs> That's just, I, I don't think John's gay. <laughs> Uh, unless I'm recalling incorrectly, John has never expressed action. I, like, I know he jokes, I'm not a homosexual, blah, 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 but uh, un unless I'm wrong, John has never actually expressed romantic interest for any guys in Homestuck ever. Like, he ex he had something with Trezzy, he had something with um, Roxy, he had a thing with Vriska, maybe, I think. I don't remember. Um, like, it's all whammon. 
creepy. He's never expressed anything for dudes. So that Dave having a crush on John isn't unreasonable, right? It's, you know, I think that's totally reasonable. But I don't think that John would ever give those feelings back. I just don't think that John is gay or bisexual. I think that he's just straight. I think that John is the one straight character in Homestuck. <laughs> So I think John being a, like, I think that their relation, uh, that Dave needing to work through his internalized homophobia and stuff like that, and John being, like, the crush that, like, like the, 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 the bi person, the gay person who has a crush on their straight best friend, like, I think that that's the role that John plays, is, is Dave's straight best friend crush that kind of goes unrequited, and then he ends up getting with Carcat and blah, 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 and Solux in my brain in my little Dave soul cat brain. Um, case closed. By unanimous decision, the jury finds in favor of the defendant, me. It seems like he's got a lot to think about and maybe this is a little heavy for the first meeting. You already feel emotionally exhausted. No fucking way we were in this for the long haul, partner. We are entrenched in this shit. You and me are fighting on the front lines of is he isn't, of is he isn't he, is he isn't he, World War One. Troops are spilling over the embankment, armed to the teeth with various literature and pamphlets. <clears throat> I'm already learning so much about myself. Oh, uh, is that good? The enemy is at the gate of my sexuality, and our air support is nowhere to be se seen. If I don't make it, tell my wife or maybe husband I died like I lived. Completely baller in every conceivable way. This conversation train has just not gone off the rails, but is crashing headfirst into the nearest village. Just some unsuspecting hamlet fallen prey to this out-of-control ride. This is no longer a conversation you have any say in. You desperately look around the room for anything else to talk about. So, uh, puppets, right? Oh, no, 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 no. You fucked up, mailman. You open the floodgates of introspection. We are balls deep in discourse waters. There is nothing to blame but yourself. He stops pacing to look contemplative. His voice lowers to a mumble. Is he still talking to you? Does he still want to talk about this or not? It is impossible to tell. Okay, now hear me out. Do I have to come up with a gay name now? Or can I still be Dave? <laughs> oh, I'm thinking Gabe, but let's not kid ourselves. That's an amateur choice. <laughs> I'm screenshotting this to send to the GC because I don't believe it's real. <laughs> no, don't turn me into Gave. Obviously, my full title would be Gave Strider Dick Rider. <laughs> I'm fucking screaming, dude. <laughs> okay, that's enough. There has got to be a better way than this. You are so tired. <laughs> wow, is this the first time that 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 reader leaves the friend? Oh my god, Dave was actually too much for him. That is so crazy. Um, are those the only two? Or is there one more route? I feel like there's one more route if we go... We go dope dope. And there's one more. Don't wear the shirt. Yeah, don't wear the shirt. Actually, you think you're fine as is. No reason to shake it up with yet another outfit. We'll have to eventually pay someone to draw. Let's take a second. Reel it in for a little bit. What the fuck is going on here? Isn't this, like, really messed up? No, what's messed up? Is this how you deny hospitality like this? I offer you someone else's property that you have to find among countless lifeless puppet corpses, and this is the thanks I get. Real cold, mailman. Damn, maybe I'll wear the shirt to protect me from this chill. Ah, enough, okay. Like, why isn't he in school? It's the middle of April. A spring break, bro. Besides, I only subscribe to the School of Hard Knocks. Also, several YouTube channels and periodicals. So, pretty sweet deal over here, actually. You know he isn't really like this. You know he doesn't live like this. Or like living like this. Oh damn, is that true? What am I like? Apparently we got the foremost expert on Dave lore here. PhD in Strider Dynamics. It's the first day of school and I'm here in class eager to learn. 
Got my pencil out on the freshest fit on. Got my dope new Trapper Keeper with the Lisa Frank Dolphins on it. Look at them on there smiling like assholes. One pink, one blue so we know it's not gay. Poor bastards don't know they're really in a cartoon. Saddest story I ever heard. The little camera switches its focus from Dave back to you, gauging your reaction. Ignoring it, you assert that you aren't trying to say you know him, it's just that. That what? Okay, clearly you've struck, struck some sort of nerve here, but now nah, we're good. Tell me more about my situation. You really have been spending time with Rose, haven't you? Got me all figured out? Don't worry, if you gotta look at the Wikipedia article for abandonment issues or whatever, I can wait. Despite how flat his voice is coming out, his body language has made a telltale shift. He's standing leaned up against the back of the futon. His hands are in his pockets. It would almost seem like he's sulking if, it, if you weren't so convinced he wanted to kick your ass. Uh. At the edge of your vision, you sense some movement. You didn't catch it exactly, but you're convinced it was there. You look over and there's nothing to see. Perhaps another hidden camera? There is something unsettling about being watched this whole time. There it is again. Every now and then your eyes catch the faintest presence of something moving just out of sight. The whole place feels like it's faintly shifting around. Amid scanning the room, a particularly fucked up looking puppet catches your attention. These little shits are everywhere, but this awful little man's stare stops your heart for just a moment. Its cold eyes pierce you. Its plastered smile judges you. You look at it as briefly as possible, if for no other reason than to note how unsettling it is before looking back at Dave. You... What the fuck? What? Oh, th that's just Cal. Cal's the realist. He certainly seemed real to you. You could have sworn he just moved around on his own. Uh, yeah, man, he does that. Don't think about it too hard. See, this is what you mean. It's not that deep. Look, I know you got some hero complex or something. Gonna swoop in and save these kids from themselves? Well, bad news, kid. That's not what this is, and heroes aren't real. John, I understand, but fooling Rose, too? The insane tricks this guy must have pulled. Dave has shifted his weight forward, while his voice is not risen above a low mumble. This is enough of a tell to know maybe you should back off. This friendship is tougher than you thought. You're still on about that, huh? Look, I'm no expert in friendship, minus the fact that I absolutely am, but you ever think maybe coming into someone's house and fucking with their day-to-day -day life is a little rude? Just hypothetical. As per normal, I'm stone cold unbothered by this turn of events. A stoic bashed in the- sorry, but did he just say stoic? What? Uh, yeah. Stoic, like, unmoved. Does he mean stoic? I mean, I guess. Aw, oh, peace, you've done it now, you weren't trying to embarrass him, oh jeez. You never, er, you try and comfort him by saying it's okay if he's never heard anybody say the word before, maybe he's only seen it in text. He frowns and goes a little quiet, this does not seem to be helping. The kid is completely shut off now. You try to bring up the puppets again, no dice, you even pretend to be Jazz about Cal or whatever his name is. Uh, whatever its name was seemingly shadow stepping around the apartment. Wow, so cool. Nothing. Dave takes out his phone and begins texting. Ah, uh, is that about you? Oh, beans. He's telling your new friends how much you beefed it. This could ruin everything. Desperate times to call for des desperate measures. Uh, and this is the most desperate time you can recall. A friendship is on the line. Cal continues to phase in and out like a poorly animated anime character, moving so fast you can't keep up. You take a few steps towards Dave. You've got to get him out of here and you know just where to take him. About a half a second into your stealth mission, you clumsily step on a puppet and it makes a pathetic squeak. Dave stops for a second but after a few moments returns to texting at the speed of sound to whoever is on the other end. Cheese and crackers, you can hear the notification sounds popping off. Whoever it is is responding back. You can't waste any more time. You teleport him as silently as you can. Besides you hear or besides you, Cal disgusting Cal's disgusting limp body floats haphazardly on the shelf. You guess he's or guess he's done? No time for this. You slowly reach out your hand. Time to get out of here and fix this. A large adult hand grabs you by the wrist. You turn to see it belongs to a muscular man in pointy sunglasses, who you wouldn't exactly describe as a twink and not exactly a hunk, but most certainly not a bear either. And why are we talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> and why don't we talk about it for several oh shit before you can begin your extremely important debate you are flung unceremoniously out of a high-rise apartment complex window as you free fall you think maybe he was more of a twonk oh my god was that did bro just toss me the fuck out wow what a beautiful way <laughs> to end stream today. <laughs> you and Ultimate Dirk, so true. Wait, maybe that was Ultimate Dirk. Wait, 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 wait. 
Wait, I think it was Ultimate Dirk. That would make sense. Why did Dirk show up? Also, Dirk being the very last one. Hmm. Mm. Hi, Solux. Oh my god, please. I want to meet Solux so bad. Oh my god. Anyways, all right, all right, all right. That is the end of stream. I'm, uh, there's no sound. Where is the sound? Okay, whatever. Uh, that's the end of stream. We stream for like two hours. Um, maybe I'll do more tomorrow. I actually do really want to get the, get through some of this game. Um, so yeah, but that is the end of stream. Um, love all you guys. Hope you have a very lovely night. Yes, and Deary and I am ending now. So I wanted to go through four routes. Like I wanted to get through Jade's as well, but um, I'm tired and my voice is out. So we are just doing uh, the first three. I just really wanted to get to Dave. I really wanted to see Dave's routes because I'm a little guy and I love Dave Strider. Oh my god. So maybe we'll do tomorrow and we'll do Jade, um, Karkat, and Kanaya. Maybe we'll knock out. We'll just do three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. We would do me. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Good night. Good night. Bye, guys. That's all for the stream. Good night. Bye. Bye.